How you guys doing this morning? Good to see you all here. You guys look beautiful. Entrepreneurship. Who knows about entrepreneurship? Raise your hand if you know about entrepreneurship. Nice. Who knows about black entrepreneurship? Does anyone, can somebody name, let's just hear five black entrepreneurs quickly. <laughs> Let me see. I, I only heard two. Let me hear some more. Lisa Ray, I heard that. Tristan Walker, I heard that. Chef, Chef Mimi, I heard that. Reginald Lewis, I heard that. Vivica Fox, Shaquille O'Neal. Give me some more. Give me some more. Who? Who? Jeffrey Sanders, right there. Nice. All right, so black entrepreneurship, it's a beautiful thing. It ben Wanzo, appreciate that. <laughs> so when, uh, when Angela told me about this, so let's have a pitch competition, because black entrepreneurship drives so much of black progress, and we need black entrepreneurs to help solve not only our problems, but the world problems. Uh, entrepreneurs are problem solvers. Entrepreneurs are life changers. Entrepreneurs are risk takers. It's risky to get up here on the stage today and present your idea. Some people may be like, eh. Some may be like, that's the greatest thing. But entrepreneurs have the vision to get up here and say, hey, I believe in this product and I want to get it out there in the world. So today we're going to help them take that step uh, and get their product a little bit exposure and hopefully some investment. Uh, but exposure and investment and feedback as well. So I want to first bring up my judges, if they can come up, all my judges. <clears throat> so these judges today are going to evaluate entrepreneurs, but before they do that, I want them to make sure that they get their proper introduction. So we're going to start all the way to the right and work our way to the left with an introduction of the entrepreneurs, of the judges, excuse me. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I need a little bit more excitement. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Awesome. My name is T.T. Ikile. I am the Director of Business Consulting with Working Solutions. And we are a micro lender here in San Francisco, and we cover the nine Bay Area counties. We offer loans um, for startups, and we also provide consulting to help uh, create uh, businesses that thrive and are successful. And I'm happy to be here today. Good morning, y'all. Uh, my name is Anthony Heckman. I'm the head of growth at uh, UniQ, uh, early stage company in the machine learning space, and uh, honored to be here this morning. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is John White. Uh, I work for Cardinal System Holdings, which is a family investment office based in Tampa, Florida, in Houston, Texas. I drive business development and strategic investments for them. Thank you. Good morning, good morning. My name is Haywood Perry. I'm hailing from the East Coast. I'm an investment partner in the New York office of the Dorm Room Fund, an initiative of first round capital. We do early and beginning seed stage investments in campus-based entrepreneurs. Uh, also wrapping up uh, my graduate studies at Yale Divinity School. Good morning, my name is Jason Scott. I'm a global program manager at Google Cloud for Google Cloud for Startups. Um, and prior to that, I'm an investment team at Highland Capital Partners. And Welcome and excited to be here. Nice. So I don't like to talk a lot, so I think I'm done talking. You guys ready to get this show on the road? Yeah. All right, so the way it's going to work is we're going to have four sectors today. The first one is retail, second one is services, third one is travel and leisure, and the fourth one is education. Uh, the judges will swap out at the, after the services, and we'll introduce a new round of judges. At the end of the program, we're going to announce winners for all each sector. So one winner will take home a prize of $3,000. They may take home $100,000 in credits from Google Cloud. Thank you, Jason. They may take home mentorship. Uh, and it's going to be an awesome experience. So let's start with our first presenter. Oh, also, you guys get to participate as well. So at the end of each sector, I'm going to have you pull out your phone, go to a link, which will be presented on the screen, and you get to vote. So your vote counts just as much as the judges. So we have five judges, and we have the audience vote, OK? So you get to influence the way today goes and who the winner will be. Yes, sir. 
<laughs> uh, you cannot boo. We're only encouraging here, and we're going to build people up. I learned yesterday if you say encouraging words in an encouraging environment, then everybody's going to feel good about themselves, all right? Okay, so let's get this thrown on the road. We're going to have our first entrepreneur, which is Shami. Right there. <laughs> Hello. Good morning. Wow, I am so happy to be here. Uh, thank you, Ben, for having me. So today I'm going to be talking about Shami Oshun. Sorry, I want to make this a little, ooh, I'm not good at moving this. I'm going to leave it alone. So Shami Oshun, I am about, I am Shami Oshun, and I started my company in sophomore year of high school, and I'm about making tech high fashion. Basically, there was this problem is that we always need free hands. And whether you're at like a friend's barbecue and you have to hold your plate and you have your fork and you have your drink and you're like trying to figure out that situation or if you're just on the go and hanging out in the city with your friends and you have, or you're on your way to work with your coffee, you need free hands. We just always need free hands, whether it's for directions, it's just always. And so, so the solution is the Bev bag. And so the Bev bag carries your beverage in style. And so here's my example. Here's my coffee, right? So this is a 3D printed bag. Um, so what's awesome about 3D printing is that it's light and durable and almost zero waste. There's only a test strip that it does before it starts printing. Um, it's designed to carry your beverage from the top and not the bottom. If you notice, this is a very small cup, but there's a ring at the top of the cup, and the design on the inside of the bag is like this 13-side shape, and that's what holds up your cup. So it works for boba, coffee, originally designed for boba, because I love boba, <laughs> and it also works for water bottles, it works for coffee cups, it works for wine glasses, wine bottles, all, that, all those great things. And so Shami Oshun is an e-commerce business. Um, our materials cost for this bag is $30 or so. Uh, labor is about $20. It takes about 16 hours of print time and one hour of hands-on to make sure everything's perfect and sanded. Our retail price is $175. Other costs include like Shopify and PayPal taking a percentage, and also the 3D printer getting that maintenance, the serger, sewing machine, and electricity, because the bag also comes in a uh, satin little, uh, it comes in a satin bag. Um, last year, because last year was like my first official year as a business, because um, I graduated high school and I got to dedicate all my time to my business, and we generated over $45,000 in revenue. And since our soft release of this bag, I just kind of like was like, hey, here's something I did. Um, I've uh, sold 15 of these bags. So customer reach, I mainly use social media, and basically Twitter is, is an amazing platform that allows me to get my message out there and spread it to the world, and I use that, and I use uh, Instagram, of course, and we have over 30,000 followers on social media. Uh, we had product placement in New York Fashion Week, viral press, and um, social media promoters. We are also in the process of talking to some local wineries and high-end stores about carrying the Bev bag. Um, and also something that I do, a give back component, is I always, uh, once in a while, I spend my time talking to the youth. I think it's important as a young person for them to see other young people doing something and they feel like they can do it. Uh, so I've been talking to different schools and nonprofits in the area. So my target market, she's a woman in her 30s, and she you know, has her job. She's making her money. She's, she goes out all the time. She goes out on the weekends. She hangs out with her friends. 
Um, she could live here in, in uh, San Francisco. She lives in New York. She lives you know, in a major city. She likes to drink. She gets her coffee or her boba every day. I'm going to include boba, even though I know it's coffee. <laughs> um, she, you know, she goes out on the weekends, and she wants to stand all, out for all the right reasons. She wants to be fashionable. So our competition, it was very hard to find something that was kind of like this bag, but a lot of people compared the bag to a koozie. And so I guess that's the, the one that carries your beer, helps you keep your hands warm. And then there's also the Boba Buddies, which is $12, and that's more of a handheld uh, thing. It's not as cute, so you know. <laughs> and um, so my name is Shami Oshun. Um, 19 years old from Hayward, California. Um, I was Entrepreneur of the Year for EY last year, uh, Nifty Northern California winner. I've been listed as uh, one of the 50 influential women in 3D printing uh, last year. I've also been featured in British Vogue, Huffington Post, uh, Teen Vogue, BuzzFeed, and over 50 other countries. Um, and then I also got to be on a Stitch TV show in Canada. So there's some of my qualifications. Thank you for having me. Three minutes of questions from the judges. Is this on? Awesome. Um, congrats, this is amazing. Um, you. And you're doing way more than I was doing at 19. So um, that's amazing. Um, I'm really curious to hear a little bit more about the B2B business that you were talking about, talking, selling it to wineries, selling it to any other customers. Who else are you targeting and what has been the feedback a little bit around that? Uh, so you mean the feedback from talking? From the customers. The, oh, from the, the customers? Yeah. Oh, well, the customers that have you know shown me that they have their bag bag, they're like obsessed. They, they tag me on their Instagram stories every day that they're using it, and so it makes me really happy. Everyone really loves it. Uh, the the store, the high end store that I've been talking to, it mainly is Draeger's in San Mateo. They have a home goods section um, with their you know really expensive uh, housewares and wines. And so I have an official meeting with them coming up about carrying it there. And then they were telling me about how some local wineries would also really like to carry this bag. So we're looking into that right now. Mm -hmm. So I'm really intrigued by the technology. Could you walk us through kind of like what the 3D printing process is like, as well as your cost margins and why you determined the price point that you selected? Mm -hmm. Okay. So. It's, it's a very long process. It took me probably about six hours to design the bag. Um, and what I, I use a program on my iPad and I build it and then I send it through a couple programs and it reaches my 3D printer and then it just goes layer by layer by layer and builds the bag. And, sorry, what was the? Your price point, why did you determine that price point? Originally, I had it I had it a little bit higher because my goal was I knew that I had to sell it as a wholesale price to the stores. Um, and so I was trying to calculate that into my price. But then knowing that I have so many more online store, um, online sales, I wanted to make it more affordable. And I also thought, you know, these stores, the people that shop at like Jager's Home Goods store or in these wineries might not be are really not the type of online shoppers. So if they need to price it a little bit higher uh, from our wholesale price, then they can. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit more about uh, you know the, the person that's purchasing the bag? And um, it seems as though you're wearing this, but you're not wearing a purse as well. So you're, you don't have a purse on yeah. with the bag. Is this something that women would typically wear? Would they wear, you know, do you envision them having you know, a clutch and this, or nothing at all? Like, what's the? How, how are they utilizing this kind of day-to-day? -day? Yeah, definitely. Well, I'm the type of person, I'm the type of uh, woman that is always wearing a big jacket or a jacket with lots of pockets. So I always, I never really carry a bag. This is like me first time carrying a bag. And um, But it also works, you know, like if you don't have your coffee and you're, you finish your coffee and you throw it away, like it fits your phone and your wallet and your keys. So it can fit your essentials. Um, I have seen some of the people that have bought my bag where they, they have like two different types of bag. Like this is, because the strap has uh, three adjustments. So this is the shoulder strap. It also has, or this is the crossbody. It has a shoulder 
and it has a handheld, so a lot of time they do the handheld and then they have their other bag. And just one additional question. Just uh, wanted to talk about durability of the product. Um, what's the longevity of the product? Can you, you know, does it get dinged up? You know, what, what's that process? Yeah, like? yeah, well, it's, it's awesome. The way that it builds it is really light, but it makes, it basically creates these diamonds um, throughout the bag, and so it's really durable, and I've even had to do more research, of course, because I've been only 3D printing for a year, and so I've only had 3D printed pieces for the year, but I've watched videos, and people are leaving them out in the sun for years, and they're, I mean, they might, the color might change, but they're very durable, and the, I mean, there's, it's not going to break, so, yeah. You. I'm getting time to ask a question. What is the uh, most common beverage? You mentioned that women, uh, women between the ages of 25 and 35. Do you know what they're buying most often? Yeah, so on my way here, so I got off in Barcadero and from walking, okay, at the little further Barcadero station stop, um, I walked from there to here and then on my way here I counted about 30 people carrying their drinks like this. And you know, it's cold outside and your hands are cold and I want to have my hands in my pocket. So um, I definitely think it's something that you could see the everyday woman carrying. Yeah. And that and that can, small, medium, large, doesn't matter, all that stuff fits in yeah, there? Yeah, so right. it's designed for a large bag, but of course it carries by the top ring. So even okay. though this is a really small cup and it doesn't go to the bottom, mm -hmm. it's going to hold at the top so you can always grab it. It's easy. Great question as well. Um, is there any spill control factor on that design? Because I'm just, I didn't see you walk with it and see if you're trying to run. Is there any feature that you're looking to enhance that, the product? Yeah, definitely. That's, that's always difficult with a bag. Um, I've found it to be hard when you are walking really fast, but what I have, um, you know, let people know that have the bag is that sling, slinging the bag on your back it doesn't bump your leg as much, and so it allows you to walk quicker. And um, yeah, that's basically the main way to combat that. Thank you. All right, next up we're gonna bring Run the World. So come on up. Hello, everyone. Okay, we're gonna do that one more time. Hello, everyone. All right. so. Thank you all. My name is Victor Sandifer, and I am the creator, the owner, and the creative director for Run the World Clothing. So I am going to get started now. I wonder what it is. Just a second. Okay, got you. So Run the World is a community empowerment brand. And I'm going to get started now. So if you can control a person's actions, if you can control their thoughts, then you can control their actions. That young man right there is me, my freshman year in high school, playing varsity basketball, throwing that no-look pass. <laughs> yep, no-look. Um, <laughs> growing up, I thought the only way in which I can make an impact on my community was by becoming a professional basketball player, making a lot of money, and coming back to my community. But it was in the 11th grade that I read Malcolm X's autobiography, and I figured out, and I was also inspired by his experiences and his commitment to serving his community. And I knew at that moment that if I never put a ball in the hoop again, that I still could make an impact on my community. But that story that I just told isn't one that's singular, but it's one that's told by many millennials of color and having that same experience. So, now, because of the internet, we have a better understanding of what we can be. And at the swipe of our finger tab, we have access to so much different information and multiple examples of what we can be. However, representation is still an issue. Millennials know where they want to go, but they're looking for leaders to lead them there. And this is why I created Run the World. Run the World is a community empowerment brand for millennials of color. Oh, sorry. Run the World is a community empowerment brand that connects millennials of color to a social impact movement by creating socially conscious apparel that ignites them to make an impact on the world around them. The symbol in which we use is Sankofa. Sankofa is an indinkra symbol from Ghana, which means look back and fetch it. I designed it with the globe in the middle to signify our belief in looking back and giving back to the world. So it's my belief that when you give back with your passion, that you run the world. 
So Run the World has four of three pillars. Experiences, which is events that we throw, um, some of them being art showcases, some of them being discussions on social issues, as well as charity basketball tournaments. Service, which is the most important part, is we're trying to create a scholarship fund to give scholarship and grants for folks who want to create, who be entrepreneurs. And last but not least, which is going to be the focus of this, kind of, of this talk, is our product. So, in doing research, there's a lot of research being done on millennial spending habits. As you can see, one that sticks out to me the most is more than nine in 10 millennials would switch from brands one to ones associated with the cause. So for me, when you look at Blavity, Toms, and Warby Parker, they're killing it in media, shoes, and eyewear, but there is a gap in the apparel business, or in the apparel sector. As you can see, the market is huge. Our initial market is black millennials, which makes up a population of 9.7 million and has a spending power of 4.1 billion. So this is a chart of, our, of some of our competitors in these key areas, values, community, stylish, cut and sew, and accessibility. And so you can see on there that Run the World is the one that checks all of the boxes. Now let's take a look at Run the World in whole. What makes Run the World what it is, is our special sauce. And this is the ingredients of our special sauce. So our message, which is saying, Kofa, look back and give back to the world. Each piece that we create tells a story about history, social issues, or current events. All of our clothes are stylish, accessible, and of quality. And it's all funnels, which is our most important thing, is our community engagement. So with little to no marketing, or little to no marketing, we've been able to do over 60,000 in sales, um, over 1,045 orders, of that 211 were repeat customers. Um, we've been featured in the film, Sorry to Bother You, and have been worn by uh, professional athletes and celebrities. So some of our growth plans includes us really focusing on our social media uh, influences, so really working on influencers and paid marketing. Um, in addition to that, we're also going to be collaborating with different athletes to actually design a line for them. And some of the athletes that we're going to be working with is Damian Lillard, who is the Hallstar point guard for the Portland Trailblazers and also a childhood friend of mine, as well as Brennan Scarlett, who was an outside linebacker for the Houston Texans and was a classmate of mine at UC Berkeley. So we're going to be working with athletes to create a line that we will design for them and then we will help create a scholarship fund in their name for their high school of their choice. So it's all about being cyclical with this idea of looking back and giving back. So with all these big, huge ideas, you gotta have a strong team. So DeMont Oliver, who's my best friend, and Jimmy Woodard, um, who's, also been, who's also a fraternity brother of mine and a classmate of mine in school, um, we all, we feel, have what it takes to make it. So we have all these different skills. Some of you have been in e-commerce, management, design, education, nonprofit, sales, working in startups, and the law field. And with these experiences, we have the utmost confidence that we can make these dreams and these goals come true. Um, so our requirement, um, so for that $3,000 that we're going for, it's gonna help us um, pay for our apparel and our inventory, which is our larger goal, which is to do over 100,000 in sales. Um, and we will do that with the assumptions that we sell our, car, our clothing for three times cost of goods with an inventory turnover rate, sorry, with an inventory turnover rate of every two months, increasing our inventory by two to 3,000 bi-monthly. We estimate that we reached that $135,000 mark, which is to do just what we said, give scholarships, $10,000 in scholarships that we estimate to do, which is looking back and giving back to the world. Thank you. <laughs> Three minutes for the judges, and let's go. Um, can you just b describe a little bit better of your target market? Um, I know that you're talking about black millennials, but kind of help me get, get a better picture of what that looks like. Um, yeah, that'll yeah, be better. Okay. So our target market is ages 25 to 45, to be honest. Um, and so um, particularly like black women and men who one also 
our young professionals, but also just one stylist. So there's three ways in which you buy in around the world. One, you buy in from the meaning. You identify with the meaning. You know about Sankofa. You know about whatever we're talking about. Black love is one of the t-shirts we have. You identify with the message. Another one is your stylist. So we make sure that all of our clothes is just as stylish as anything that's on the market, particularly in the streetwear sector and the kind of mid to high range fashion. So we make sure that everything is on par with those. So you might jump in because you think you're stylish and you like the style of our clothes and it's up to trend. So those are usually the two ways in which people identify with around the world. First, uh, thank you. I want to go back real quick to one of the things you said at the beginning, which mm -hmm. was that nine and 10 millennials of color would switch brands if they could go to a brand for the cause. Yes. I suspect that your like, marketing and influencer campaign will have a lot to do with that. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about how you're going to get influencers beyond the first two that you mentioned? Yes. So yeah. everyone wants to be a part of some kind of movement or be associated with a movement. And a lot of folks, we're talking to ones that particularly have influence when it comes to the way in which they dress initially. Um, and so we're, what we're doing is we're designing apparel with them um, giving them the opportunity to tell us how they want to design it, thinking about things that they are interested in and things that they want to use in terms of like looking back and giving back. We design a collection with them and then we put it out, we sell it, and then we give the, some of the persons, some of the proceeds to create a scholarship fund for their high school. And so that's kind of our giving back thing. And I, I, reaching out to them for that is how we're going to make sure that we get there. Hey, how you doing, man? How you doing? Is this shirt that you're wearing? Uh, yes. This is on one of the new shirts. This one isn't out yet, actually. This is our uh, Black Liberation Dream Team. So my idea was, do you want me to answer that? I don't know. Okay. So my idea was, I thought I'm a basketball player. I knew that one of the things I really liked was the caricature basketball championship shirts that they used to have. That made me think about the Dream Team, which was the 92 Dream Team. And I said, if I had a Black Liberation Dream Team, who would be on that Dream Team? And so this is my like fantasy draft of folks I think, dead or alive, who should be on that Dream Team. So, so let me give you a bit of advice. I'm concerned about what you're saying and then your move to look for influencers, yeah. um, particularly uh, athletes and, uh, and entertainers, because what you talked about was, your story was that you were in the 11th grade, you thought you would make it to be an athlete, but you realized there was something different because you were at Malcolm mm -hmm. X, right? So that's one concern. The other piece is, you know, think about, you, you think about your FUBUs, your Carl Kanais, right, um, that era. You also think about the X that people used to wear when Malcolm X was, was coming up. Um, and then you see this new viral thing that went on with Obama with the 44 jacket, right? Mm -hmm. Just think about all these things as you're, as you're facilitating your brand and your influence campaign. Yes. So I'm curious about the, the, the seasonal nature of streetwear. Can mm -hmm. you tell me a bit more about what, how long it takes you to design, how long it takes you to go to market, yep. and what your strategy is to kind of be on the front lines of fashion trends yes. as they're kind of quickly going mm -hmm. about. So uh, it usually takes us anywhere from three to six months to come up with a full entire collection. Um, in that we also have like sub collections and um, I don't necessarily feel, I, we do, so we do a spring and a summer. Um, I mean we do a summer, spring, and then we do a fall, winter. Um, and so we put out a lot of like small things in the spring and summer and do our really big things in the fall. Um, so even right now, we're already planning, even though we're just about to release this new stuff, we're already planning for the fall right now. So um, we start well in advance. We have a, a meeting in the beginning of the year where we plan the whole year's collection up front. So. Thank you. Hold on, before you go, just take that t-shirt out and show the crowd. cover work on it and so you can collect them. So I have like three or four different artworks on them and you can collect all of them. Nice. All right. Cool. So our, our entrepreneurs are amazing. He flew in from Atlanta. Shami, you're only what, 19? Nice. So uh, you guys are going way above and beyond what I would have done as an entrepreneur. I guess that's why I'm still a broke entrepreneur. Um, <laughs> But keep hustling, you guys. All right, let's come up with our next, which is Ball by Yourself. It's definitely a pleasure to be here. Um, recently, I was on uh, another TV show, and it was called The Elevator Pitch. And I just need to say that 
this panel is a beautiful panel to be on because that panel was not looking like this. <laughs> so I, I have to say that and get that out the way. Um, thank you guys, my name is Chad Briscoe. Um, I'm a former European professional basketball player, trainer and coach. And um, I'm also the inventor of the amazing Ball By Yourself Basketball, the world's first and only basketball training product that allows players to train 100% of the time without ever chasing loose balls, focusing on self-esteem, um, self confidence, and safety. Over the last 12 months, I have personally manufactured and sold over 1,500 units, not just here in the States, but also in the UK, Brazil, Turkey, Spain, and Australia. Each unit costs $15 to produce and sells for $69.99. And I'm so excited to be here and I just wanted to demonstrate real quick so you guys can see personally what it does. Never chase loose balls again. Hello? Um, can you, well, uh, first question, can you tell us a little bit more about who's buying it currently? Right now, my market is kids from 5 to 14. That's been about 85 to 90% of my market. But recently, I have found out based on other people seeing it. I've had kids with autism use it. The parents love it because it keeps their focus and it keeps them engaged in creating physical fitness. Also, I was recently at a tournament and a young lady came up to me, about 65 or 70 years old, and she asked me how much it was. And I told her, and I asked which one was your son or your grandson, and she said, no, it's for me. I have arthritis in my arms. And I saw how you was passing the ball so I can work my arm out. And I was like, wow, that's good. And then I get a call from a guy who, from the UK, is in a wheelchair. He plays for the National Wheelchair Association out there. And he said, hey, can I use this so I can practice? Because sometimes I don't have nobody to practice with. So I was like, wow, that's another one. And then I have kids who recently been hurt, torn Achilles tendons. The mom's like, hey, my son is down, my daughter's down. Can you please send me a ball because I want to keep their spirits up. So now I got videos of kids using my tool because they can't chase the ball anymore, but they can still work on passing, shooting, and their confidence. So my thing is getting the product out to as many people because basketball is not just about training or about fundamentals. It's about people using it for their everyday lives. Got it. Um, follow on to that. As someone who's been playing basketball for forever, um, one, out of the ones you named, which of those seems like the biggest opportunity or that you're most excited about? But then two, um, thinking about the professional athletes like yourself, mm -hmm. um, do you see any kind of um, way to break into that or do you see any opportunity there? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, recently I've had um, um, a gentleman who plays in the, uh, the G League who used my product. He said, man, this is great because a lot of times when you have practice, there's a lot of times that's, that we have on downtime. So this would be great to just go out and just do some work by myself. So. The G League is somebody, well, the G League is the place that I'm hoping to get in, but eventually my biggest goal is to get into the NBA in all 30 arenas and have a basketball in there. Hey, I would love to know more about your, your strategy for distribution, right? Mm -hmm. So like, what are the primary kind of distribution channels like for the units that you've already sold? I think you said about 1,500 mm -hmm. units, right? So th those that you've already sold as well as future projections, mm -hmm. and then what sort of marketing are you planning to do around it? Well, marketing, well, first let me answer the first one. Um, I do a lot of events. Uh, my last big event was at the Reno tournament. I don't know if you guys know about that. It's the largest tournament in the country. And we sold out in a day and a half. And it was my first time getting to an arena to see pretty much what it can do. And I had to fulfill like 300 orders by the time I got back. So I sell online and I sell at different venues going out to different um, festivals and um, camps, AAU. Um, I'm into two different high schools, and I'm into four different AAU programs and two junior colleges. So I do a lot online, sell out the trunk of my car. I, I get it out any way I can. Yeah. And can and you also talk about market 
when it, when it comes to fulfillment, right? So you said you sold out. How long does it take you to restock, and what does that process look like? Well, it, it, would, it normally takes me about a week and a half to restock, but now, because I found a manufacturer, because now I, I produce it myself, but I found, uh, recently found a manufacturer that can produce up to 100,000 at a time. Mm -hmm. So once I get those big orders, I'm ready to go. Wanted to ask a couple questions very quickly. One is, do you have a patent? And if not, when will you get one? Second question is, um, given that you're about to produce 100,000 units, it seems like this is a product that doesn't need to sit on a shelf. People need to be able to see it in action. Mm -hmm. So what about your sales team uh, and the growth of that? Um, and then um, thirdly, uh, are you thinking about training videos or any, any type of ed educational campaigns uh, in the different markets that you, you mm -hmm. mentioned, autism, seniors? Mm -hmm regular basketball players and so forth. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm sorry, the first question that you asked? Patent, yes, I filed for my patent and also I filed for my trademark. Um, my trademark should be here next month. Um, I just received the information from them stating that I just have 30 days to wait. Um, filed for my patent, my utility patent. And what was the last question, I'm sorry? Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, so that's part of it because I want to have a team because there's um, um, organizations across the country that's already looking for me to come to their areas. So putting together a team is definitely going to be key because you have to have those. Because my thing is getting out there and demonstrating and getting people to see exactly what it does. So I love going to personal, um, doing personal um, events, camps, clinics, and um, videos is something that I actually have right now, I have an app that you can go on, so if I sell a ball to a kid, they can go into the app and see me and other kids doing certain videos, um, drills on there. And um, eventually getting into the space to where I want to create a fitness video. You guys have heard of P90X? I want to create a fitness video to where people can use this and incorporate it into their physical fitness activities and just take it across the world. Question? Cool. Uh, you said something really interesting that your dream is to get in every NBA arena. Uh, but based on what you said initially, it seems like there's a huge market opportunity amongst older folks, people who are recovering from injury, disabled. How are you going to, you know, kind of uh, raise awareness amongst uh, those groups? Well, I'm going to I'm going to tap into those communities. I'm going to look because what I have to do is what he was talking about. Um, I'm having sales salespeople have to go and create a team to target those individuals and just kind of get feedback and see how interested they are, and then create something around that. And Real quick, I know you got to get out of here. I want to show you guys real quick the evolution of my product. It's only going to take a second. So, can I just, just speak to quickly um, uh, regarding your um, piggyback on the sales team? Uh, I would highly recommend that you also put together an advisory team mm -hmm. um, that has um, access into some of those new channels that you're exploring. I think it would give you some additional leverage if you can get associations that would. Uh, endorse uh, what you're doing. Yes. And then the second thing I wanted to speak on is the competition. Obviously, you have a patent that helps, um, but is there any other product out there that could rival what you have? Well, I'm the first one to create this. So there are other products, but I'm the first one to create it with a basketball. So I don't have any, any competition. The only competition that I have is anybody that sells training products, not specifically a basketball training product. Mm -hmm. Real quick. So when I first started, I created the basketball. I just picked up a basketball, real nice basketball, and I started creating it. Then I wanted to move into doing branding. So I created a brand with my own logo. So I have my own product. And then I moved into creating a product that actually comes out of the ball. So you have the string that comes out of the basketball. And now I want to show my brand new product that I'm just created, I'm gonna launch in a couple weeks, is the ball by yourself strap. So there's a lot of kids in urban communities who can't afford my ball. So I wanted to create a strap they can use their own basketball and have fun anytime and anywhere. So
Sorry it took so long, guys. All good, man. That's ingenuity that we need to see. Okay, so our next group is the Pillow Pack, if they want to make their way up. After Pillow Pack, I'm going to ask you guys to vote, and then we're going to have a quick three to five minutes where you guys can vote. The judges can get their thoughts together on who won the retail round, and then we're going to move on to our next round. All right, so let's have Pillow Pack up. These ladies, I'll let them speak for themselves. I'm not going to say anything. Don't really need a mic. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. My name is Trinity Jacob. I just turned 17 years old. My name is Monty Mason, and I'm almost 17 years old. We go to Oakland Second High School, and we are Pillow Pack. So you might be wondering, why do you even need our product? Well, if you travel a lot, like if you came in today on a long flight and you didn't have a place to rest your head probably needed a pillow pack. If you're a student who doesn't have a place to put your stuff, but also kind of wants to sleep during your boring lecture, you need a pillow pack. <laughs> if any of you has a kid that constantly is going to sleepovers and their friends neglect to give them a pillow, they need a pillow pack. If you work in a corporate setting and you find that your back is always hurting from sitting at your desk all day with nothing to lay on, you need a pillow pack. So, pillow pack is a uniquely designed backpack that is also a comfortable pillow. It's suitable for everybody, especially those that are frequent travelers, those who work in corporate settings and need a little bit of cushion, and children. Through our many, many different designs and our three different sizes, we're able to reach everybody and help everybody express themselves without sacrificing practicality. So not only is our product super kid-friendly and convenient, but it's also made with 100% cotton hypoallergenic polyfill. Because both me and Moni have super severe allergies, so we don't want to be sneezing during the plane ride and waking everyone up. Also, it's totally reusable, so you do not have to worry about hurting your environment by keep buying plastic bags to hold your stuff. Not to mention that, but it's easily transported because guess what? It's a backpack. <laughs> it's super easy to use. You just grab your stuff, get packed, and you go. Now, let's talk about these spicy financials. As you can see, our COGS, our cost of goods, is $14.73. Why? Well, because we base it. <laughs> trying to call me quiet? <coughs> <coughs> Hello? Not anymore. Our basic, I mean, no, I'm sorry, not everything. Our largest pillow pack, we use it to calculate the rest of our COGS because from one yard of fabric, we can make four large pillow packs. From that same yard, we can make six medium sized pillow packs. And from that same yard, we can make 12 small pillow packs. Now, that means that this gives us the overall price of an estimate of how much we can spend or plan to spend on our pillow packs. In the last three months, we sold 61 units and made a revenue of around $2,400 and a profit roughly of $1,500. Now, with the money that we will win today, we will be, I mean, if you didn't know, these are all handmade. So personally, me and my family sit for hours and hours and hours sewing and sewing and sewing, which means I don't have time to sleep. I don't have time to turn into assignments. I can vouch. Sometimes, you know, college is coming up. I would love to start applying for applications, but um, you guys like these, you know? So. so with the money that we will win, we want to get a manufacturer. Why? Because it saves time. It, it will produce so much more, and it'll make it easier for you to give us for us to give you guys so much more product in a faster time. Cool. So you might be wondering, why is Pillow Pack attractive to people? Well, simply, we have a product that people really haven't seen before. Have you ever seen a person carrying a pillow on their back and then pull something out of that pillow? I don't think so. Not only that, but our colors are so bright and endearing. And in a world like San Francisco, where everything's just gray and drab, it's nice to see a pop of color, you know? And also, due to the fact that it's only us two, 
We talk to every single customer. That means we develop personal relationships with all of our customers. This brings them back to us not only once, but sometimes twice to buy more from us because they trust us. We also do promote on social media. Follow us on Instagram at pillow.fact. <clears throat> and we also do occasional uh, flyers in public places like our school, for example, and open houses. Now, you may be wondering, well, who is Pillow Pack for? Well, it's simple. It's for you. Pillow Pack as a company is designed to fit everyone in this room. So our larger sizes are generally more considered mature fabrics, as in they're darker colors, and can fit uh, office supplies and just your basics at the office. So like laptops and files and stuff like that. Although they do come in more colorful and fun fabrics because we do encourage adults to really express themselves. Do whatever you want. We support you. Like, we got you. <laughs> but those fabrics are usually more destined for the smaller sizes because the playful and fun fabrics are more targeted towards the children category. Now, speaking of adorableness, let's talk about our competition. Pretty sure you've all heard of Pillow Pet, right? You know? So Pillow Pet sells a product that is a stuffed animal that transforms into a pillow, which is cute and all, except for they only have one line currently that we know of that actually is a backpack. However, this backpack still has that big old puppy dog head on it, which means that if you wear this down the office, you're gonna hear, is that a grown man with a dog on his back? <laughs> I don't, I, that I don't get it, you know? And if you don't wanna hear that, then we got your back. Just buy a pillow pack. We're very similar, however, they only reach one audience, which is children. We help you express yourself, and we reach all of you, and we let you express yourself. <laughs> so once again, my name is Trinity Jacob. I am the CDO and CMO, along with my co-CEO. My name is Moni, I'm the COO and CFO, and we would like to give a special thanks to my family for helping with production, to Build, who we've been taking since freshman year that helps with entrepreneur and teaching kids how to be an entrepreneur and how to run a business, our supporters, and of course, our customers. We love you. So, thank, thank you. you. We will now take questions. <laughs> hey, y'all look comfy with your pillow packs on. I bet your back don't hurt. Real quick, great presentation, great energy. Thank you. I see you guys. I, it's cute, it's my favorite one. You've Thanks. got great presence on stage, so own that. And um, great creativity coming up with this idea. Awesome, awesome, great team. So, but real quick, some questions I have. Um, the, I couldn't catch the price point, as well as how many units have been sold. Um, and then um, also the manufacturer that you're planning on, what would be the new price point based on that? So our prices were on one of our slides, but I'll quickly talk. So our smallest one is that one right there. It's $25. Our medium size, I'm pretty sure you have it, is $35. And our largest size is $40. Uh, we are looking for a manufacturer. I haven't chosen one yet because we still want to get a trademark and we're still looking into a patent, which is kind of hard because, you know, Pillow Pets is really big and we're scared that they have already made a basic patent for it. Um, so definitely want to trademark before that. Um, and so manufacturing, I sit at home, we cut them out, we put them together, we sew them, we stuff them, all hand done. We've also sold 61. Yes. How many, how many of your uh, classmates have asked for one of these? A lot. Too many. Too many? <laughs> Our friends sleep in class. Yeah. Did you come up with the idea when you were sleeping in class? No. no. So. We are diligent students. <laughs> we are diligent. Um, so, in the beginning, um, in build, you get put in teams. I was in a one-woman team. The rest of my team had left, and we were stuck selling, you know, like this little water bottle, but it had glitter that was going to flow down, and that's pretty it basic. Really it was really basic, uh, and I was not with it. And the previous year, we were in a team together, and we did a product called Pillow Talk, which is customizable pillow. Put a picture on it, some words. I was like, what if you could carry it? And so, in that same day, I drew out the pillow pack. And the following day, in the day, I made the first prototype and brought it back. And that's how we got Pillow Back. Um, and then later, they were like, well, you need a teammate, because that's a lot of stress on one person. And so 
fellow friend came and joined me, and now it's just us two, and we're working it out. Yeah. Um, wonderful presentation. Um, made me smile. That's 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 great. A um, couple things. I have three kids. Yes. All right. Uh, and and as you know, kids are fun, but kids are also sloppy and 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 and, and they they're washable stuff, right? They are washable. They are washable. I, I would encourage you to think about maybe like a, a sanitary attachment or something gotcha. like that, right? That you can kind of put on it. The other thing is I travel a lot, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and I have to carry a backpack when I travel um, as well. So maybe an attachment to my to my backpack, you know, that I'm that I'm carrying. Uh, my laptop, uh, books, pens, the whole nine. But because I'm on a plane, if I could. Like literally, if I could yeah, have that. Yeah, so the put it on largest top. size can fit a MacBook okay. and a couple notebooks, like a small thin ones that you get at like free stuff, and a couple of pens. So you could definitely use the pillow pack for that. Um, also for the <laughs> also for the sloppy thought, we also thought about that too, and we were thinking of maybe trying to do like covers that you could take off of the pillow packs. That's what we're but that would be extremely hard and we're working on that right now, but with everything that's going on, yeah. So, so, so we're, being, we're being good on time right now, so I'm just gonna say for everybody in the audience, these are incredibly comfortable, okay? And as a, as a future, as a, as, a, as a past president of the Future Business Leaders of America when I was in high school, I just wanna give you a strong word of affirmation. You did an amazing job. That's crazy, high school, high school. We wanted to have a whole high school round, but we can only find. Yeah. So I didn't say anything about them because I knew they would speak for themselves, but also this should speak for itself as well, which is a $3,000 virtual check, but you, <laughs> there will be a real one. And right now we are going to, if you can bring up the link, for the, for the audience to vote, excuse me. Uh, we will see who will win this round. We won't see until the end because the judges still have to confer, but I will show you the audience result in about three minutes. We're gonna jump right back into the pitch competition. This time, we are going into a round of services. So all the pitches coming to the stage will be presenting services, and to kick us off, we have the need R&D, so help me and welcome them to the stage. Woo! Her to the stage. Hello, everybody. Thank you, seven people. Let's try again. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, so I am not a tech person. I'm not a business person. I'm a single mom, and I run a nonprofit. And this organization was essentially created because my mother was the greatest hustler I ever met. Um, she raised three kids. She had, at any given time, anywhere from two to seven jobs. She was a janitor. She was a talent recruitment manager. She was a bunch of stuff. Um, the best thing about her, though, is she gave opportunities to other people. So with Lenny r and we do the same thing. I also don't know how to use this clicker. I'm going to just be honest. Uh, but what I do know how to do is get black people jobs. So essentially, what my business is doing and has done for the last four years is monetize white guilt. All right, what does that look like? Um, there are a bunch of companies, many of which are here today, like Uber, like VMware, that have less than 3% representation of people who look like us. Um, some of it is because they don't care. Some of it is because they don't know how to do anything about it. And then some of it is because they recruit talent who look like you all, but then they have a terrible experience. They report discrimination. Um, they deal with all types of backlash for speaking out about racism, and then they leave. A few years ago, Google had an initiative to bring more diversity. Uh, they were at about three or 4%. After millions of dollars and after a lot of work, they still had 4%, 3 or 4%, but it wasn't even the same 4% that they started out with, right? Um, for me, my organization gets hundreds of thousands of dollars from law firms. A lot of those firms, their diversity chair is an old white man. That's a problem, right? Essentially, my company will do two things. 
The first thing is we will reach out to talented black candidates, specifically in Louisville, Kentucky, where I'm from. Shout out to the South. Um, and help them to cultivate the best possible portfolio, resume, interviewing skills, to make sure that they're fully prepared. The second thing the company does and has done is talk to those companies that are terrible at diversity and either got in trouble for it, or just out of the goodness of their heart, they want to change those practices and help them to be better citizens in this world. We have uh, women engineers at a lot of companies that are facing these issues, and when they go to their boss, they go to HR, they're told just to like calm down, right? Be quiet, chill out, like it's not that serious. The same thing happens for black people, for Tongan people, for those who speak English as a second language. So this company is focused on taking that and turning it into something much better because we can definitely do better than 4% black people in the city of Oakland or in San Francisco, right? And uh, by show of hands, how many of you have hiring power at your job? All right, how many mediocre white men have submitted resumes? A lot, right? But we also have colleagues who are black who are very talented and are uncomfortable with submitting a resume. They think they're underqualified. They can have a master's degree. I have a friend with a JD Juris Doctorate and a PhD, and she was nervous about applying for a job, right? And that's something that we do on the candidate side is focus on making sure that person is prepared with mentoring, with making sure that they have all the tools they need to be successful, to be confident. And uh, yeah, so I'm also not that great of a public speaker, but the company is great. So, see, black power, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna go through a couple of the slides. Um, so I'm, I'm focusing specifically on Louisville, Kentucky, where I'm from, because there are a bunch of people. I have 100 resumes right now of people asking me to help them get jobs. These are people who are qualified but don't necessarily have the connections um, out here in Silicon Valley. So my job, and this is something I feel is my social responsibility, is to get them the same opportunity I've been given. I grew up in the projects, um, and there weren't any people who were working in companies like this. So to see something like Coalition of Black Excellence, it's amazing. It's like what my mother would have wanted, and I want to bring that opportunity to more people. Um, let's see. Some of the kids we work with. Um, so again, the other things I've offered for companies are sexual harassment training, uh, diversity, like recruitment and retention strategies. I also analyze the data of companies that are doing really poorly to figure out maybe where they went wrong, survey some of their employees who left. Um, and it's been really successful. So the three parts are learning, linking, and leveraging. Learning is the candidate part. We teach people how to like maximize what you've done, right? How to talk about yourself in a way that makes people want to hire you. The second is linking. We connect them with companies that lack diversity um, and also connect them with mentors. And finally, leveraging. So for the companies that have gotten in trouble for lack of diversity, we also leverage that so that they are more open to um, our candidates. Um, as most of us know, the pipeline is the link between like a student saying, I might want to be a lawyer in high school, to them getting to college and changing their mind. Um, a lot of people who look like us drop out of that pipeline along the way. So this company is focused on making sure those students don't drop out. And in fact, the number increases. For those of you who are educators, we're also aligned with the Common Core curriculum. Um, it's really important to do this. And we have contracts through uh, different school districts in order to make sure that students who would normally drop out instead have an opportunity to either become entrepreneurs or become uh, entry-level candidates at large companies. All right, these are some of the things I would spend your money on if you gave it to me. Um, <laughs> the biggest thing is, I'm, like I said, not a tech person, but one thing I can do is serve every single person that needs help. So there would be sort of a hub, there would be a marketplace. It's like a connection between maybe Yelp and Indeed. I get a bunch of resumes uh, in my job from people who are not qualified or way overqualified. So what this would do is give uh, employers the opportunity to see a bunch of resumes that are very specific and handpicked. Uh, it's a little more tailored and it's specifically for businesses looking to improve on diversity. Um, the other thing it'll do for candidates is show ratings. So for the jobs that like have a high number of uh, discrimination cases, or like they, this job has a really good mentorship program for uh, black candidates, or they might have an ERG group, right? So 
excuse me. Um, that's what sort of the website would do is make it so that I become, it's like a digital version of me. All right, so I made a lot of money doing this. Um, and this is like a projection. So the first two years, of course, are like the money, is the money I actually make, one minute? Oh, zero minutes. All right, so we're gonna skip to the end. These are some people I work with, and I'm going to open up for questions. Quick question. Um, well, awesome. I work at Google, so I understand the, the, the problem for sure. But um, quick question um, for you around, you say you made a lot of money, you showed the money, um, but you mentioned a lot of different types of services that you do. Can you talk about which one is actually, what are they paying for you? What are they paying for and who's paying for it? Who are some of your customers? Uh, so the latest customer, we worked with uh, Ebony, I don't have it up there, but they had an issue with not paying their uh, employees, specifically black employees. Uh, so I worked with a person and their new staff to um, get classes on like diversity and inclusion, mostly for their white employees. Um, so it's the sexual harassment trainings are one of the most popular and uh, discrimination training. And then the third is, um, is retention. So like a lot of people know how to recruit, like go to a fair, get some people, but not a lot of companies understand how to keep them there. Um, and I usually do a referral, so like I have, um, they'll say like we have this many black employees or we're projecting we'll have this many black employees after going to these events. Um, and so we need mentors who have this qualification. And so that's where the resumes come in that I have and say, oh, this person has done HR for 10 years. They're the perfect person to mentor this entry level candidate. Can you, can you actually go back to the slide for us that has the financials? That's a question we're both gonna find out in a second. Let's see. <laughs> it turns out I can. But that college degree yeah. to work. So Which the, uh, one? the one you just passed. Yeah. Yeah. Can you actually can you walk us through that? Yeah. So um, let's start at 2017. Um, so this is only money that I personally made from connecting people with jobs. Some of it is the candidates paying me to help them prep their resume. We do um, sort of like um, speed dating, except with like job interviews. Um, so, so folks pay for that, and then companies have also paid me to do the same thing for them for potential candidates. So instead of a traditional job fair or a career fair, we'll have a speed dating situation uh, with people from those companies. They don't guarantee jobs, but they do pay me for the services. Um, and then I've asked like a good faith effort of the candidates, like if you get a job, give this percent. If you don't, no worries. And there's like an honor system. I don't check, I don't have time to check to see if they actually got the jobs. And then like if they did and they didn't pay me, that's just, maybe they'll stub their toe later. I don't check up. <laughs> um, tell me a little bit about your specific journey. And I'm also curious, how do people find you? You know, how did you establish this network? Um, and how's it, sort of continue to, to evolve. The other question is just around staff. Are you thinking about sort of a train a trainer approach? Like how do you, as you said, duplicate yourself in real time with a real person going forward? Uh, so the first thing is I have a degree in Pan-African Studies from University of Louisville. And part of our degree required that we do some sort of internship that we built. Um, my mentor, Dr. Tamara Adams, had a connect program where uh, we as upperclassmen had to mentor younger students. And a lot of what I've based this on is based on what she wrote. Her dissertation was all about like making sure that we keep it in the community and continue to turn over the dollar uh, with ourselves. Um, so that's like my academic background. And then in terms of duplicating myself, I'm not great at staff management. I know my strengths and weaknesses. What I would like to do is just make a digital version of that that uh, maybe has a team. But that's the part I'm struggling with and would love some support on because that's not my area of expertise. Well, thank you. I um, <clears throat> appreciate you for speaking, speaking some uncomfortable hard truths this morning. You talked a lot about you know, people who are failing. I would love to get your thoughts on, on why you think they're, they're failing to improve. Uh, so there's a quote from the beginning, like, if you don't intentionally include, you will unintentionally exclude. Um, people just don't care that much about things that don't infect them, it turns out. Uh, and so I think that the companies, because profit is the main thing, and they kind of do some good stuff, like in India or somewhere, or they kind of do some good stuff because they went to a school and gave like one scholarship. So I think we have to impose upon them the importance of doing this work. And there's no like uh, group holding people accountable. Like you don't get in trouble for lack of diversity. New York Times might write about you, but that doesn't hurt your profit. And I don't necessarily know if a boycott is a way to do it, but holding folks accountable by having this hub, having that rating system is um, really what it takes. That's what's missing right now. 
I just wanted to applaud to your confidence in stepping up here. Um, you kept apologizing. Don't apologize for the things you do. Um, I think we, are li we, we, we tend to want to just be the one to voice out the weaknesses. I just want to tell you, don't do that upstage. Uh, but you spoke and you engaged us well, and, um, and I was able to kind of at least pull, pull, you pulled me in, and I love that. So I just wanted to let you know. And then I was kind of uh, wanted to know, I didn't know you didn't, you were not, you seemed like you traveled in to, for today. Correct? Uh, no, I did not travel here. here for today. Oh, so, so you're already based, based here, then, yes. in the Bay Area. Okay. All right, got it. Because I was just because you mentioned a lot about Kentucky and connecting people from Kentucky to the uh, to the Bay. But what is your strategy to penetrate it into uh, getting more diversity in the tech industry? Because I didn't see that representation on your right. Yeah. Uh, so <clears throat> primarily, I want to work with uh, folks in Louisville because of that. Because there are a lot of people who have degrees that some of you have, um, or the resumes that some of you have, but there's nowhere for them to work. Um, so I wanna do, I think it's important to start very small so that it can be high quality and then we can replicate it. There are so many talented people out here who kinda already know what the options are. Um, whereas in Louisville, Kentucky, there's a high number of black people who have degrees or have the experience but don't have the connections. So essentially, I actually just closed on my house on the 12th, so I'm moving back to create this hub. Like I'm leaving my well-paying job to go do this, whether I get a grant or not, because like it's absolutely essential. If I didn't have mentors leading me down this path, I wouldn't be here, I wouldn't even know you all existed. Um, so even if it didn't make money, that's what I would focus on. Does that answer your question? Is it a nonprofit? Uh, this will not be a nonprofit. This, okay, okay, because you mentioned about grants. Um, I, do run, I do run a nonprofit. Okay. Sometimes I, I mean investment, not okay. grant. Okay. Um, so you will get your money back and some more. All right, thank you so much. Give it up again for Lene R&D. Woo! So now you can vote. Is that, oh. Oh, oh, next, yes. okay. okay. So, so now we will jump into the next pitch. pitch. Um, contestant, who is Pop Up Connect. Help me in welcoming Pop Up Connect to the stage. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Spencer. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Pop Up Connect, and we connect artisans and makers uh, with pop-up spaces so they can sell their goods. Um, and our mission is to really make retail more affordable and accessible for more businesses out there. All right, so across the country, retail rental rates are soaring. Um, it's becoming a problem, making it very difficult for artisans and makers um, who want to be in store funds to be able to actually enter those spaces. Um, so we are a, a platform that's going to be able to help them get in those spaces. In Oakland, we see um, over double digits in terms of increases year over year in rental rates. Um, and again, this causes a, a really high barrier for new um, businesses to enter into the market and makes it hard for it to diversify those businesses in, in, uh, in places and cities. Um, so this has actually created an $8 billion industry around pop-up retail spaces. Um, and these are really fantastic for businesses to get in front of their customers, be able to showcase their products, um, and even use that as offline marketing so that they can drive more online sales. Um, so these are great um, avenues for that, and then shoppers love them. Uh, this is a great place to be able to see a lot of products in one place, they're very unique, and um, uh, buyers get to interact with the creators of those products. Um, but there's a problem, there's many problems to this market, to this type of industry. Um, they're extremely hard to find, uh, they, not just for um, cu uh, customers and users, um, but it's extremely hard to find for the vendors, they actually have to go um, and network and be able to get into these uh, markets by word of mouth. Uh, and so there's not, a, there's not a, an easy way for them to find them. Uh, the application processes vary. So there are different applications from site to site. Uh, it can be PDF forms, emails, uh, uh, or they are managing these things through spreadsheets. So it's uh, very disjointed. And then uh, lastly, marketing. It's hard for everyone, um, but for small businesses particularly, marketing is really hard. Um, they have to use different tools to be able to reach their customers and uh, tell them that they're in these spaces. Uh, so our platform, Pop Connect, is a one-stop one place for all of these makers and, um, and organizers to be able to connect uh, and, and make these uh, businesses more successful. All right, so how are we gonna do this? Um, so what we have is a few ways to address this. The application process 
um, is something that we have pared down to just be one place for uh, vendors to find um, spaces and organizers to connect with those vendors. Uh, the, 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 the vendors get to just create a profile. The single profile can be used to apply to multiple events. Um, on the organ organizer side, uh, the management process is going to be simplified. They currently can get like over 100 applications for a single event. And uh, they usually manage this through spreadsheets so someone can fill out a form on their site or, again, a PDF form that they send in. We're going to have just a one place for them to be able to review, accept, decline applications, um, and even message people straight from the platform. So it makes it much simpler for them to manage these events. Um, and the last piece here is around promotion advertising. So again, uh, marketing is really hard for them, and they have to do this for every event. Uh, and we want to make a very simplified platform for them to be able to advertise. So they can connect with Facebook, Instagram, Google Ads in our, uh, through our platform without having to go and learn how to use each of these platforms. And we'll do that through the API. Um, so what's our model? Um, we're going to take a, just a small 5% booking fee off of the uh, transactions. Uh, so most vendors are already paying an application fee. Um, this is just an additional fee um, for us to be able to cover costs and continue to, to help grow the, the business. Um, and then we'll have an opportunity for the organizers to, to use our platform, and they can pay to use our advertising platform to be able to market their events more easily. Uh, and the last thing is using some, um, adding some add-on features for the organizers to be able to manage the events, like their financials, understand what is successful, what businesses are successful in their events, um, and kind of keep track over the year and how much they're spending. Uh, so what's the competition like in the space? Uh, our competitors are primarily these peer-to-peer -peer, uh, rental space uh, companies, like PeerSpace and Appear Here. Um, so they uh, offer business storefronts um, that are uh, available to rent, and um, you know vendors can come in and rent it for an hour or more and set up shop. Uh, but the the problem here with these is that um, for these vendors, and specifically makers and artisans, they need to have shoppers. So they're I'm not inclined to use these spaces um, as much because it doesn't help them drive the traffic to their site, to their, to their, to their uh, business. Um, so we're an early stage company. Um, we have just launched our website, popconnect.net, um, just in December. Uh, and we've been working with organizers and, uh, and makers uh, throughout the last year just to understand what their needs are to create this. And so we're really starting with the supply side on the, on the organizers. And, uh, um, and really using them as the way to, to grow this business. So they already have a network, they do this manually, um, and they are just need a, a way to manage this more easily. So when they put our uh, platform on their sites to, to apply to events, then we will already gain users um, both from the, the, from the organizer side and then from the vendor side as they're applying. Um, and then again, it's free for those organizers to list uh, these events, uh, so it's, it's something that's gonna be low cost for them. They already carry a lot of costs create these. Uh, and then for the uh, vendors, once they apply to these events, they can uh, submit other events that they want to be on our platform too. So this will kind of help grow it as well just by word of mouth. Again, this is a community that has a really strong network. And in order for this to kind of grow, it needs to, it needs to be um, through that network. So my name is Spencer. I am the CEO co-founder of Pop Connect. Um, I have a background in advertising, so I've uh, worked at Google um, over five years. I'm doing um, online ads with uh, small businesses. I work with thousands of small businesses with AdWords and currently working on commerce ads for Google. Uh, my co-founder, John, he's also at Google and he's a uh, part of um, Aerial and 20's startup incubator, but he's a serial entrepreneur and, um, and also notably a maker. He does jewelry with his girlfriend, so he knows the, the industry really well. Um, and so for us, um, we are looking for funding to be able to market to be able to continue to help these organizers make their events grow uh, and, and, and start to understand more about what they need in terms of online advertising um, and drive more traffic to, to their, uh, their events. Thank you. T talk to me about the cost of customer acquisition, because uh, it seems like you're, you're acquiring customers on two ends of, of each you know, spectrum and then just the cost of um, since on one end of the spectrum they're not necessarily paying for the marketing, how do you envision that process taking place and really helping them um, from that perspective? And the last piece is on the, on the vendor side, not paying for marketing? Right. Yeah. Um, so for acquisition, again, for us, it's really about starting with the organizers. Uh, currently, we're just going out to these events, finding out who runs the, runs the markets, talking with them. Um, we actually just had two users sign up, uh, two of the organizers sign up on our 
on our platform to be able to run their events this year. Uh, so again, starting with them, it's going to really drive the growth of uh, additional vendors coming to the site because they're going to have to use uh, the vendors going to have to use our site to apply to these events. Um, so we're starting with those, we're going to be able to grow the the market from there, uh, and then from that point, um, as we have more markets on the site, we can start to drive traffic to the site for shoppers, people looking for these markets and interested in coming to shop for those events. So that's that's the strategy in that. Um, the cost right now is our time and going out to, to do this. Uh, once we start to look at other places and spaces to get on the platform, uh, this may be where we are looking into some of the sites like PeerSpace and see who's already doing this and renting these spaces out. And maybe we start to go into storefronts um, and advertise in that way. So the, the cost right now is our time and, and going to, to individually these markets and, and get, them on, get them on the platform. So I'm a, I'm a visual learner. Yeah. So could you kind of provide us a case study of what this actually looks like. I have two kind of pictures in my mind right now. The first one is I'm thinking about Kanye West and Yeezys. And when he first started, he had like pop-up retail. Mm -hmm. That's the first picture I have in my mind. The second picture I have in my mind is like the vendors that are downstairs, right? Who are here at an event, right? And so you have a 5% booking fee, right? I'm guessing that means that for events that do not charge vendors to be present, they would not be your target. Customer, no. is that right? Right. Okay, so then can you, can you paint a picture of what that looks like? Yeah, so it will look more like um, a like a fair, craft fair, or market, um, similar to let's say like, yeah, like what's going on downstairs, where there are um, a bunch of businesses in the same place. Again, this is a where it creates kind of a mass for a lot of people to attend these events when there are a lot of different businesses. So that's what we're starting off with are these larger markets. Typically, they'll have between uh, 20 to 70 uh, different vendors at these events. And um, you know a bunch of uh, foot traffic. So it, it, and and for the um, application process, usually they'll send these out um, six, three to six months in advance. Uh, the the they'll have an application go up on their website. Again, they use their their social media channels, uh, and then uh, the vendors will apply. And they can some of the some is typical the same, the same type of vendors, or they really try to look for new vendors in these uh, in these spaces. So we want to be able to be a platform to help them find new vendors. So just a quick follow-up, why would you choose Artisans to be your initial focal point? Yeah, um, well, one of, the, one of the reasons was I went to an Etsy craft fair, um, and I love the passion and the amount of uh, you know, entrepreneurship happening there. Uh, this uh, industry is um, overwhelmingly um, women-owned businesses. Uh, it's a very underserved uh, area, and I, and I just saw that as a, a place where really we can, they don't have a lot of technology in it, um, and really try to help um, these businesses continue to grow. I enjoy working with small businesses, and this was just one area that I thought um, they could really use um, a way to, to, to grow and have more of these events. Real quick, you mentioned at the top that this is a $8 billion uh, market globally. Yeah. Do you know what, piggybacking off what he said, that like the events versus the pop-ups and random stores, do you know how that breaks down? Um, so a lot of this will go to um, the like, things like equipment, the kind of the entire experience that's happening around, um, around the pop-up events. Uh, and, and this also includes those that are for like large corporations that they may do like, you know, Google or Spotify may do a pop-up event in some area where they're uh, trying to you know drive some more you know traffic to, to their sites. Uh, so it's something that's used by both large companies and down to again smaller markets that are happening every single week or weekend, um, like farmers markets or other types of things. Uh, what will be the difference between what you're offering and uh, places like Pop-Up Stir and uh, Pop-Up Blue? Yeah, so in terms of the differences of them, Pop-Up Stir is a very similar platform um, where, they are, where they have, uh, um, they have a, a, a marketplace for both of these um, businesses to kind of connect together. Um, and same with Pop-Up Hood. Pop-Up Hood, uh, they are not as open, so you, supply, you send an application in and, and they'll kind of do everything on the back end for you. They'll reach out to, the, to those um, uh, businesses and try to make the connection for you. And I believe they're also for helping people to be in spaces long term. Uh, so it's a little bit of a different model um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of how they're going about it. Um, we're more focused on the advertising piece as one of the ways to differentiate ourselves from both those businesses. We're not so much running the events, but helping the events to be successful. Thank you, thank you. Give them another round of applause. Woo!
Yeah, this is, this is great. We are moving right along. And to make things speed up a little bit, because we want to make sure we're respecting everyone's time, we're going to limit the judges to have just like three questions or pieces of feedback. So that's what we'll do going forward. And to jump right into the next presentation, we have Minnie Wo, who's going to be giving her pitch. Help me in welcoming Minnie Wo to the stage. Good morning, everyone. My name is Melanie Akule, and I am founder and CEO of Minwo LLC. Twice as hard. Three simple words, um, but Shonda really knew what she was doing when she created this scene between Olivia and her father. Um, black women, we work twice as hard to receive half of what they get. And that's a trope that's not just felt by black women, but many minority groups around the world. Now, what surprised me about this, however, is how this was applied to black women in business. We found um, Kansas, Kansas State um, did a research study on black women, uh, businesses owned by black women. Um, and they found that between 2002 and 2012, black women were owning more businesses at a rapid rate. They were outpacing other minority groups um, and other intersectional groups. However, if we look at the revenue they received, in that same amount of time, it's amazing the, drastic dif the stark difference. Um, black women, on average, earn revenues of around $30,000. And compared to not white men, but other women minority groups uh, who make $143,000 per year. So looking at those numbers and looking at that disparity, we want to understand why, how, and what could we do about this particular problem. So we started with working with a couple of companies, um, literally just started with two, to learn about how they operate, what, so, what are some of the pain points they face, and how we could potentially address them. We, found, we summed that up into three questions, three addressable business challenges. So the first being, how do we help them scale? Um, the problems that we're seeing is they're typically single person run operations. They're overwhelmed, they're wearing many hats. Um, the next question is, how do we help them strategically invest in their companies? They have slim margins, they are price sensitive, and so being able to pay for the help that they could use to scale their business is a challenge for them. And then finally, how do we empower them as business owners? There's a lot of information out there, there's a lot of people looking for this particular demographic, um, but it can be overwhelming. You know, you, you go to Google and you want to Google, how do I start a business? And you have 20,000 different results and 20,000 different ways to get to that point. How do we simplify and reduce that? So as me and my team were working with these two companies, we decided, well, we obviously don't know it all. We don't have all the skills. So why don't we bring in consulting companies that can help them, also minority and women owned. Um, and we found that working with this particular group, as we connected them to these businesses that we were working with, they also had challenges that we could potentially help them with. First being, how do we eliminate non-value add activities? So a lot of what we learned from them is that a lot of their engagement time is running around with the client, trying to help them understand what exactly their problem was. Um, and then whatever that problem was may have been outside of the scope of that company. And so now they're stretching themselves beyond their skill set to try and help that company, et cetera. The next thing that we learned was how do we reduce customer acquisitions for costs for them? Um, so also them being single scale operations, they are spending money on social media ads, they're spending money to find new clients, they're going to conferences, et cetera, um, just to be able to find clients that can help, that they can bring in or keep their pipeline full. Um, and then lastly, how do we help them focus on their business operations? How do we help them focus on the things that they actually enjoy doing? So from everything that we learned together, we developed a community that essentially enables both sides to benefit um, from the pain points that they face. So we have clients that are a constant pipeline for the business consulting companies. Um, they also get to work with people that look like them, that understand their pain points. And then the business consulting companies are benefiting through more consistent revenue um, and also lower cu customer acquisition costs. Uh, we've done this by creating an online platform. Uh, it's called Rialto. Right now we have a couple of features that are available. So first is a business services catalog. 
where clients can go and readily buy the services that they need. Um, this is kind of flipping consulting on its head. Usually when you talk to a consultant, you, you tell them all of your problems, they, they go and they crunch numbers and they come back to you with a price that you may or may not be able to afford. Here in the catalog, they see those prices up front and they can either pay for them then or wait until they have enough money. We have other features such as um, crowdfunding campaigns. So what we'll do is if a business owner cannot afford the services on the platform, we will run, um, think of a GoFundMe type of campaign for them um, and help hope that the external community will help them pay for those services for whatever um, project that they're working on. And then we also have monthly meetups and an event calendar, curated resources, all, at, all to make um, all of these resources available to these um, clients. So where are we? We are currently in our prototype stage. Um, we launched last April the prototype um, and we've been able to see um, pretty interesting growth so far. We have about 14 Minwo partners, so those are business consulting companies. We have just under 20 clients um, all on the platform. And we um, relaunched the Minwo microfunding campaigns back in November. Um, from an economic standpoint, so this is all about economic uh, network effects. We've seen just under $3,500 in orders come through the platform so far. Um, the first purchase being in about November when we finally had um, partners submitting their services to the catalog and um, getting that momentum going. Um, and then we've seen about 20 orders as well. Um, we also do what we call business health assessments, which are free. Um, that's me and my team that sit down with the client first to do a full pain point analysis to help them understand areas, gaps in their businesses and areas where they could potentially leverage a partner's help. Um, so that we've seen that be a, a way to quick, more quickly convert clients from being passive to more active in working with partners. Um, so what we'd like to do next is move from prototype to a scaled solution. Um, so right now we're using Weebly, which is a drag and drop um, website editor plus a Slack community. Um, and so we've learned that there are a lot of hurdles, a lot of pain points that clients, new, uh, new members are facing in order to get up and going. Um, so we want to design that and then a few other things in a more custom application just to make the user experience better. Um, and then when we get to scale, uh, monetizing uh, at scale is through a membership fee, potentially having this platform be used by venture capital firms to help them reduce risk um, when they're working with these um, types of businesses. Um, and then right now, in the short term, we are providing services ourselves as just a way to make revenue. Um, this is the competition landscape. We consider it on two vectors, business collaboration versus traditional consulting. Um, and then last but not least is the team. And I will open the floor up to questions. Um, congratulations, this is awesome. I think um, everything in the future work is really awesome. So one question I have for you is, um, one issue that I know a lot of these platforms run into is around, um, and actually for the last speaker I had, it's a question around stickiness and how you actually get people to use your platform versus bypass your platform once you identify projects that they can work on, once you've identified the kind of solutions and connected those clients. Mm -hmm. Have you thought about that and like how have you thought about retaining those customers and making them, forcing them through your product versus yeah. having them bypass it? Yeah, so that really comes through. So the minimal partners are actually our, our, our clients, right? So they're the ones that pay a membership fee. Um, and we're really trying to design around making sure that they find the most value in working through our platform. So if you think of it as a consulting, as a freelancer, or like a small consulting company, you're using Google Hangouts potentially here, a calendar app there, maybe Calendly if you want to schedule there. Um, and so as we design the custom application, we want to make sure that all the features and functionality that they need to run engagements is done through that. So contract, contract management, how they price their services, how they advertise, how they run product timelines, that's all um, features that we want to build into the custom application. What are some of the commonalities? You mentioned you have 14 consulting partners you're working with now. Mm -hmm. What are some of the commonalities amongst those 14? Um, as in behavioral? Just like, the, you know, in, in terms of the work that they're doing, can you tell, in terms of like identifying, okay, these are yeah. our kind of core? Um, they're actually pretty diverse. So we have um, one that's focused on like digital marketing. We have another one that will build websites for you. We have um, someone that can do contracts and help you get set up with your LLC. 
Um, the idea is not to focus on one particular vertical, but to if you as a business owner need help with whatever, you can come here and find a partner that will help you with that. Um, so functionality, fu functionally, they're pretty diverse, but as far as how they run their businesses, we found commonalities in that, again, they're single, op single operators, um, so their biggest problem is how do they scale. Um, being able to find new clients and keep their pipelines full is a problem that they're facing. Um, so those are all things that we will, over time, try to chip away at for them. Mm -hmm. How are you finding um, the black women entrepreneurs um, and, 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 and attracting them to your offering? And the other question is, are you thinking about sort of broader partnerships and offerings with you know, JP Morgan Banking or Bank of America or WeWork or you know, other kind of ancillary things that people are really u utilizing quite a bit in the, in yeah. the workspace? And if I could just add on to that. Yeah. So ties in, how do you, because you're a platform, how do you then also assess the quality control of those who are on your platform? Right, okay. Um, so first, the, on the competitor landscape slide, so what we do is actually, um, I, I go through GroupMe, WhatsApp groups, because um, you see a lot of this connection happening anyway, so in a group someone will say, hey, do you know anyone that can help me with my business plan, or hey, can you da 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 da. Um, and so those are the, that's usually where I will, if we have a service that's related to that, I'll drop it into that Facebook group or into that group me, um, and that's how people are finding it. Um, more recently, we just started a referral program, so people that are already on the platform, they're telling their friends about it. So for example, um, one of the clients knew someone that does business taxes, and next month our theme for the month is handling taxes, so she referred that person. They're now a partner on the platform, she's uploading her services so that she'll be ready once we um, run that campaign to be able to provide those services to the members on the platform. Um, remind me of your second question. Quality, quality control. Um, so right now, that's a very manual process. I work with all the partners as they're onboarding to understand what their prices, is, their prices are looking like. I give them feedback on how they may want to repackage it based on what we've learned about the clients. So if um, they have a large body of work and they want to price it at say like $10,000, I let them know, hey, you might want to think about doing that more milestone based so that people can pay as they go so that it's more for affordable for them. Um, you still get the full body of work, but you don't have to, you don't have to wait until the end for payment. You can kind of get paid along the way, um, and it's a win-win. Um, also, there's a, right now, there's a nominal $50 per year fee, which kind of is like a good faith, like I'm actually here to do business. I'm actually here to provide quality. Um, and then also, I, I leverage the partners as well. So in order to build my own business, I've worked with them and paid them to help me with marketing, to help me with the things that I just don't have time or the ability to do. So I kind of test how they perform that way too. Thank you, thank you. Minwo, excellent consultant company. Consulting company. Okay, so we're gonna keep things moving right along. So now we're gonna have IP Jen come to the stage. IP Jen, give him a round of applause. Woo, I need the energy to be up. This is excitement. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is James. Here for um, IPGen, founder and CEO. And um, first of all, I just want to say, you know, to all the other entrepreneurs, um, I heard a couple of you say that you were looking for patents and all of that. Um, I can actually help you do that on the side, free of charge. Um, I'm not trying to, you know, solicit any business because I don't do that anymore. I worked for um, IBM for five years doing that, and I can, you know, um, point you in the right direction because it's very expensive to. Uh, reach out to patent attorneys in that way. Uh, so that's just first of all. Um, um, IPGen, uh, once we get fully developed, we'll be able to actually help you do your full patent application submitted and do all of that for a very cheap rate um, just once we fully develop. Uh, so uh, like I said, um, I was working for uh, IBM for five years and, and through the whole drafting and patent prosecution process, um, I saw that it was very expensive and very time consuming. Um, one patent application could probably take like a week to draft. Um, and then once you submit it to the patent office, you might not hear something back for like two years because there's a huge backlog because there are so many patents uh, being submitted. Um, there was over uh, one million uh, patent applications submitted last year to the patent office. 
our goal is to have IPGen be required for um, patent attorneys um, to use before they submit a patent application to, uh, to the patent office. Uh, we also plan to um, um, go out to other countries who have patent uh, systems as well and require IPGen to be used for those as well, um, just to start off. Um, so the problem, so our first, our first goal is to develop a patent generator, which will, uh, using AI and machine learning, which will uh, develop a complete custom patent application for you know anyone. Uh, say for example, uh, IBM, they could give us their information and we could generate a patent application from the start to finish um, quickly, you know. Um, so that's gonna save the attorneys time and money on the back end. Um, we were alpha tested by um, uh, patent attorneys, patent agents in the field so far. Um, we received great feedback. We received um, what they wanted added to IPGen. Some of them wanted search features. Um, the generator is the end goal, and and once we start developing it, I saw other steps, you know, steps to the generator that we could monetize. The first um, product or service is a claims classifier, which will let me get, let me get to the other slide. Um, which here's the um, here's the demo uh, user interface. Uh, the attorney or whoever is uh, submitting a patent application. Uh, the claims are the meat and bounds of the patent application. It's the most important part. And so you would um, copy and paste your claims into the claim field, and it will spit out. The first um, bar graph is the prediction of the rejections at the patent office, uh, 101, 102, 103, 112. Um, the goal is for you to minimize your back and forth with the patent office. Because once you submit that patent application, uh, they'll issue uh, what's called an office action, and they're pretty much gonna reject your patent application. And you have to um, amend or argue your claims and submit it back. This back and forth could go you know, you know, up to another year, um, more cost and all of that. So once you, um, once you input your claims here, you'll get this readout, and the bottom graph is telling you why IPGen made this prediction. Um, this, is, this isn't a real claim, this is just to show you. So it, um, it'll be a group of words on the bottom and the attorney can go back into the application and see exactly what they need to change. Um, and that's the first you know, service that we're offering. We're gonna launch, um, we're looking at a May date right now uh, for the claims classifier. Um, our target audience, uh, law firms, corporations, universities, um, government agencies, anyone who utilizes the um, patent um, process system. Also, you know, the average um, Jane or Joe who are, um, you know, who are building things in their garage and they might need a patent, you know, to be done. This will allow them to have a quality patent application just like the big boys produce for uh, for a cheaper price, um, because a lot of them can't go out and spend tens of thousands of dollars uh, for a patent attorney, you know, so they can, you know, you know, utilize this service and have the same uh, results. Um, the market right now in the U.S. for this uh, will be on one, uh, 150 million per month. Um, our projected fee per customer per month is 700 um, to 33,500 dollars. We came up with that price point by taking a patent attorney's salary and breaking it down to the hour to see how much time this actually saves, and then we took one third of that savings to charge them, so they could still, you know, fill the fill the savings where they can, you know, um, take those savings and do other things with them in their firm. Um, the projection right now for the revenue um, for IPGen over the next 18 months is 14 million overall. Um, after that, the monthly recurring revenue is projected to be 1.8 million per month. Um, we plan to uh, use social media heavy since you know, we're in that kind of world now. I can, I can actually go out to the decision makers at these firms and these corporations directly without having to you know, go through different channels and speak with them directly. Um, we're actually calling and talking to people 
uh, doing demos of the service um, because we want to make it a community where they have somewhere to go to utilize this service. Um, here's the team right now. It's just me, full-time, um, founder and CEO. Um, uh, Dan's my AI guy. Uh, Dante, uh, Dante, Irvin, and Troy went to Virginia Tech with me, undergrad. Uh, uh, they're all um, in different fields. Dante is into um, uh, real estate. Uh, Irvin's a sales guy. And Troy is into um, investment banking. Uh, they all bring different um, advice to the table. And once we get going, I plan to bring them on full-time. The traction is, like I said, um, we've got customer feedback from you know different types of people who utilize the um, uh, patent process. Um, they're ready for it to come out. Um, uh, we have some um, early adopters that are, that are going to use it uh, when it comes out. And I wrap it up there. Cool. Yeah. First, thank you. Um, you know, it seems to be in line with the trend of a lot of uh, legal documents getting generated automatically, so I like that. Is there a difference between, you know, auto-generating these docs and, like, incorporation docs or other docs that, that a lot of firms offer for free now? Well, well, like you said, um, those type of documents are pretty much a template where, you know, you fill in information. A patent application isn't. It's misconceived that it's an application. It's, you know, um, some of them are like 25 pages to, uh, to 100 pages. It's different types of fields, you know, written description, uh, figures, um, abstract, all those things. So it's not the typical application where it's similar to those types of things. Yeah. And you said your target customer for this is you want to get into law, you want law firms to use this to yes, keep law firms. your costs down? Uh, yes, because, um, well, it, you know, it's patent prosecution as well as litigation. Um, uh, litigators can use it as well to quickly find um, invalid patents. Um, so it's good for litigators as well as uh, drafters and prosecutors. Cool, is, there, is there any sort of customization process that needs to take place um, based on industry? That's my first question. And the second question is, you know, data is a huge concern and data privacy. So how are you protecting the data that you were, would be receiving from all of these different innovators? Right, so right now um, our servers are cloud-based. Um, in a few months, when we you know, um, go out and get office space, I plan to have uh, physical servers in-house with uh, security to, uh, to cover the data, um, you know, uh, to limit data breaches. You know how you know, things right now, everyone's getting into data. So I want to be able to secure that for the customer. Um, the, customer uh, the customization for the, uh, and for the generator, for the full patent generator, um, they will have to submit their invention details to us, which will be secure um, for that, um, for that uh, patent generation. But for the claims classifier, they don't have to submit that information. Yeah, I would just encourage you to add uh, you know, somebody from blockchain, blockchain uh, expertise to your team, and also uh, your, you know, enhance your advisory board with folks from the, you know, to, to complement yourself right. in the legal community. Okay. Uh, and also the government community um, as well. Um, other piece was just around competition okay. and, and the natural tension between you know, the law firm and their fees and your offering, uh, being that you want to be kind of the source of truth you know, for law firms, for consumers, kind of the whole nine. All right. Thank you. We're going to transition to some new judges. Uh, but quickly, I just wanted to do another round of introductions, and I asked the judges to keep them brief because we are behind time. Uh, so as brief as you can be, let's do it. So TT, we'll start with you again. I'm TT Ikile. I'm Director of Business Consulting. We work in solutions. I'm Chantel Garvey. I'm a co-founder and general partner at Reach Capital, and we invest in early stage ed tech companies. My name is LJ Irwin. I am a program lead at the Google Cloud for Startups program. We help early stage startups build on top of Google Cloud. Hey everyone, John White, uh, director at Cardinal System Holdings, a uh, family investment office. Cool. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Haywood Perry, investment partner with the Dorm Room Fund, early seed stage into student campus-based entrepreneurs. 
Hello everyone, Chris McLemore. I am the program manager for the Oakland Startup Network and we help entrepreneurs go from idea to pre-seed. Thank you again, judges, for your time and your insights. And I will now turn it over to Ben, who will start our travel and leisure sector. Thank you. Uh, I hope everyone's doing well. Uh, my name is Ben. I'm a first year MBA student at Berkeley Haas. Um, before Berkeley, I was working on Wall Street, worked at JP Morgan in investment banking for five and a half years uh, before coming out to the West Coast uh, with my entrepreneurial spirit raised high. Um, today, I'm going to talk about On The Fly, uh, essentially a, uh, an app or a platform to connect uh, folks with airlines to sell last minute seats uh, through machine learning and using historical data. Um, I'm not sure if these are the most recent slides, but I can just go with it as well. Um, all right, so when's the last time you guys been on a flight and realized that there's a ton of open seats? You start to look to your left and to your right and say, well, how much did that guy pay, pay for his seat? How much did this lady pay for his seat? Did I get a good deal? Did I get the best deal? Essentially, airlines have these, uh, these programs, specifically it's called a DeLorean, where they track historical data, consumer behavior, and depending on when and where you bought your, your ticket. I essentially and initially came up with this idea uh, back in March when I first got into Berkeley and I said, you know what, I'm quitting. I'm quitting my job, cashed my bonus, and I left. I essentially traveled all over the world. I essentially, I took a flight from New York JFK to Paris, Charles de Gaulle, and I noticed in the middle of the summer there was 27 open seats. And I literally took a video from the bathroom in the back of the plane to my seat in 7C. And again, I counted those many seats. I thought to myself, there's got to be a more efficient way uh, to essentially price these uh, flights or price these tickets. Why aren't airlines capturing all the profits? So that's exactly what it is. Why on the fly? Well, there's a reason and there's a pain point why airlines aren't selling last minute seats. You know, historically, if you want to go to, let's say, London right now, you can go to SFO and, and they're going to charge you a premium of maybe $7,000. But the problem with that is they don't get repeatable and returnable customers. You might just sell that one, t one, t one ticket for $7,000, but that's only going to be one, and there's still going to be a ton of open seats. Whereas instead of selling that one ticket for $7,000, you can sell plenty of other seats for $1,000 or, or a little bit less than that and, and recoup uh, more profits. How did I conceive the idea, which I just spoke on, uh, came to a essentially a realization throughout flying and, and traveling all over the world that there's always open seats and there's got to be a way where through historical data, through consumer behavior, and I'm working with Salesforce, it's called Einstein Analytics, where they're looking at previous data and structured and unstructured data uh, and essentially c coming up with some sort of thesis or some sort of conclusion to uh, you know, find these inefficiencies and really monetize these. Uh, OTF, on the fly, will be a subscription app and still in prototype, so I'm working with a few Berkeley engineers uh, trying to get the platform up and trying to uh, work with uh, vendors. So essentially I'm working with Erin Omar, who is the CEO of AirAsia, uh, and we'll be looking at a summer internship in Thailand. Also working with Larry Summers, who is a head of, uh, I believe head of strategy at Delta Airlines in Atlanta. Uh, and so this is essentially, again, a, a subscription app where folks can essentially uh, literally, you can be in class, you can be at work on a Friday and say, hey, I'm, I'm done, I'm tired, uh, I want to get away for the weekend, I want to go literally right now, or literally in the next few hours, or tomorrow. You can look on the app and you can say, well, these are the flights that, uh, let's say, Delta or, Air, or America or United are willing to give up at a certain price, uh, and you can essentially you know, uh, make that switch or make that uh, purchase on the app, so in-app purchases. Uh, market, okay, immediate addressable market, of course, it's around a $2.1 trillion, or sorry, $1.5 trillion. Your TAM, which is your total addressable market, is about $2.1 trillion, which that will be the vacation or the travel industry in 2027. Projected numbers, of course. Um, our niche is essentially the, that young professional, that student, um, that, that person that pretty much doesn't have any family members or, or kids that have to, you know, take them on to, uh, Onto the onto the flight, you can literally just go by yourself, or if, if or if you have a couple, you can go with your with your uh, fiance or your uh, your girlfriend or your partner. Uh, what's the hook? Well, it's essentially tied back to what I said earlier that there's a lot of flights that 
airlines aren't capturing on, on, the, on, these, uh, on these inefficiencies. So I'm coming in where I'm partnering with these flights and, and essentially selling books, uh, books bookings uh, to these last minute uh, folks, to individuals, and to also companies. And so when you think about um, you know, understanding the market, you think about you know, there are so many inefficiencies and, and, and trying to monetize that. Um, essentially, this is a hotel tonight for apps, for hotel tonight for flights. You have, um, I don't, I don't want to say cannibalization, but airlines don't obviously want to, you know, say, hey, you are selling this flight for a thousand dollars, but then also two days before the flight, they're gonna they're gonna charge two hundred dollars. Essentially, that's cannibalization. But what Hotel Tonight has done with hotels is they create a third party where they don't have to sell on their site. They use a third party like a Hotel Tonight, and that's essentially what I want to do for for flights. Um, why this in industry? Um, Spoke to a lot of folks in the airline, spoke to a lot of folks at um, airline, uh, airline companies, as I said, AirAsia and, uh, and Delta and United. And there's just a lot of old systems in place that they're not reinventing. When you think of all the, for example, magazines uh, that are in the back of your seat that affect the weight of your, of your flight, or the weight of the plane, which essentially costs dollars because that's burning up more fuel. Um, there's a lot of inefficiencies, just one of, one of many that I, that I pitched a lot of the airlines and I definitely want to pitch to, uh, to you guys as well. Uh, seeking, and this is uh, my investment, seeking $15,000. This is a little dated, but uh, I'm still working on the app and still working on the MVP uh, too. And then also working with Amazon Mechanical Turk to market and to really scale to the masses using Facebook ads uh, and really just trying to have this first mover's advantage um, against other airlines. And this is myself, uh, we're pitching on Shark Tank, and uh, this is last year, and I will be pitching to them in March, uh, and it will be airing in, in ABC in June. Uh, and that's it, eight seconds. Uh, first off, I will say the, the metaphor that you used about this is essentially hotel tonight for air travel was spot on. Yeah. Like that immediately got us all leaning forward and saying, okay, we get this idea. And now everything you said after that just like fell lock and step. So I would, I would definitely persuade you to lead with that, lead with that analogy so people can understand the idea. Uh, one question about which is different from Hotel Tonight is that I think you said you were going to charge a subscription fee. Is that correct? Um, can you talk a little bit more about why are you charging the subscription fee? What are users going to get added benefit from the, the, the fee and how that differs a bit from Hotel Tonight? Yeah. So I think the subscription fee pretty much ties into this whole fact of, you know, of course, you just download the app, you pay an in-app purchase. That's just one way. But uh, airlines want more money than that. They, they don't want to just, you know, you, they don't want you to just pay that, whatever, $14.99 uh, one-time fee. They want this yearly subscription fee so that they can cover these costs. And once you pay the subscription fee, a yearly subscription fee, the monies that you save, uh, every flight you take, you might save an incremental $40, $60, $80, $100. That's essentially going to be more than the, the uh, initial subscription fee. So you're definitely going to have, a, uh, when you think about a cost-benefit analysis, you're going to be saving a lot more in the long run. I had a question about just your broader approach. Uh, seems like you have a lot of thoughts in your head about uh, points of alleviation or efficiency that can be driven with airlines. And you some pretty high-profile players from sure. the airline. We think about a broader sort of ERP play, where this is, you know, kind of one, like a platform approach. This is one thing, but then there are other things. Like, what? Can you maybe talk about that more in terms of so a marketplace or a platform? Yeah, I mean, one of the things you're going to do is now you're doing this, right? Yeah. But um, perhaps there are other things that you have in your mind around efficiencies that you, that you talked sure. about in the airline space. Is there is there a platform approach to this, or is it, are you just going to focus solely on, you know, on the fly? So there, there's two or three inefficiencies that I, that I didn't mention, but this is the main inefficiency in the airline industry that I wanted to focus on. Um, another thing that I, that I pitched, and this is like more complimentary, is also digitizing like magazines. And of course, you know, like I said before, magazines create weight on the airline, and that creates to more energy and more uh, gas being, being, being used, which of course equates to more money. So that's just one of the, one of the many things that airlines can, can work on. Um, so. Uh, great presentation, Ben. Uh, quick question. 
Can you talk a little bit more about your go-to-market strategy in relation to your competitors? Like, what are you going to be doing to kind of stand out amongst the crowd? And I'm thinking about um, apps like Skiplag or, yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. I think um, for us, our competitive advantage, or the comparative advantage is the fact that we're partnering with, partnering with some of the more like smaller tier airlines. You're not, we're not really going after, and we try to go in after uh, again, like a, a uh, Southwest or things like that. Some folks aren't really ready to implement that. Um, but like in Air Asia, Air, uh, with Erin Omar, she's extremely interested in this idea. She's extremely interested in just like how you want to create a new type of travel for folks where, you know, typically when you want to go somewhere, let's say, you know, we're in February, you want to go to, uh, let's say, Puerto Rico in June. The feelings that you have now is not going to be the same in June. You know, you, if you want to go, you want to go now. You want to have that, that experience on demand. And this increasing, uh, cl the current climate that we're in right now is really, you know, you want something quick, you, you have the feeling for it now. You know, if you really want, want a really good ramen, why not go to Japan? you know, two days and just, and just go out there and just like explore it and, you know, come back and just be satisfied. So that's exactly what we're trying to, trying to build. What, what was some of that early feedback that you've already received from airlines? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, yeah, so quick, quick to the thing is, yeah, they pretty much said that's really, it's too early on. Um, and they have, they pretty much had this, this sort of uh, historical way of doing things. But I pretty much say, you know, you got to question the status quo. You got to really go out there and change things up, especially in this in this age and the uh, this fourth industrial revolution. So, yeah. All right. Thank you. A round of applause. All right. So now we have coming to the stage someone from the south side of Chicago. So Chicago, stand up. We have Dapo to represent his company, City Spoon. A round of applause. Good afternoon. Hi, my name is Dapo Kalawale, co-founder and CEO at City Spoon. Raise your hands if you love food. Awesome, I love food too. And I'm glad we could all agree on that. Now raise your hands and keep them raised if you've ever said this to yourself, where do I eat tonight? And do you know why we're saying this to ourselves all the time, whether it's a Friday night or 11.30 looking for a lunch spot? It's because there's super villains terrorizing our society when it comes to dining. And there are two of them in particular. And yes, I said supervillains. The first, let's call them Fugle. Fugle is an app that shows an endless scroll of restaurants nearby, but doesn't get you any closer to the decision. Unless all you care about is proximity. How could you possibly pick from that? How could you possibly get any closer to a decision? Fugle is too broad. And Fugle has a villain friend. That villain friend's name is Kelp. And Kelp is this giant platform where it's supposed to find the best places to eat based on what other people have said. But you have to sift through all these reviews just to figure out what they've liked, and you don't even know if you're gonna like that thing too. You see, the information might be helpful, but you are hearing from people's experiences after they've already done it. And that might be too late for you because you are trying to eat now. And these two supervillains, Fugle and Kelp, have all these minions working for them. Minions such as Open Table, I mean Open Fable which tells you you can get a reservation now, but half of the time when you get to the restaurant, your reservation never makes it into the system. And then they tell you you have to wait an hour for your food. And all this is creating friction in our society day in, day out. And it's just not happening to you and I in this room. It is happening to Americans everywhere. These supervillains have taken away 132 hours from couples trying to decide where to eat. They've attacked 69% of Americans who say they want to try something new with 61% of them not knowing where to go. Basically, we know we want new taste, we don't know where to go for it, and we're wasting a ton of time in the process. Well, it's time to squash the supervillains. Because let's face it, when it's Friday night, you can't afford to spend 45 minutes or more looking for a right spot. Because all you want to know is, is it close, will I like it, and can I, t can I, get, can I get a table now? And besides, we don't want to get boo hangry. And if you are a restaurant operator, and still use traditional methods to connect with your customers. Your competitors are going to take every single one of them because they're better equipped to have meaningful interactions with them, and you're not. A recent survey shows that 80% of consumers want personalized content, branded content, delivered directly to their mobile devices. So why is it only 18% of restaurants use business intelligence to make that connection? Why is it only 43% of restaurants use analytic solutions? Shouldn't 80% or more restaurants try to do this? Restaurants are falling behind. So what's the solution? Meet City Spoon. 
the IoT AI SaaS platform that gets you closer to a decision pronto and helps restaurants interact with their guests and influence their dining decisions in real time. How do we do this, you may ask? Our superpower is taking the approach of the Waze app and bringing it to dining. If you've ever used the Waze app before, you know it gets you the fastest route to your destination possible by matching your driving patterns with traffic conditions. We are doing the same thing for dining. We are learning your taste buds, matching with wait times at restaurants, get good food into your mouth now. We're just not saving the, the day for you by giving you smart dining suggestions based on your taste. We are saving the day for restaurants by generating valuable data which allow them to connect and have meaningful interactions with you. But why now? This number, 101.6, the Restaurant Performance in Index, a monthly composite index that tracks the health and outlook of the US um, restaurant industry. This number indicates a decline in same store sales and customer traffic and has consistently been over 100 for the last 12 months. Any number over 100 indicates that there's room for improvement in the industry. That being said, in 2017, the, rest, the restaurant industry spent $6.2 billion on restaurant, on restaurant tech. And that is projected to go to, to $6.6 .6 billion by 2023. And with over 98,000 restaurants feeling frustrated, restaurants will increase tech spend on data and digital, digital um, engagement. That being said, the way we plan to generate models is through a SaaS model. The way we plan to generate revenue is through a SaaS model. And the way we connect with these people in the first place, our go-to-market strategy is built on these platforms. One, partnering with restaurant groups. Two, having a presence at trade shows. And three, sponsoring local food events. And we do have competitive, um, formidable competitors in this space, such as Shop Advisors and Gimbal. Since our launch in May of last year, we have over 1,200 restaurants on the platform in Chicago, over 12,000 across the United States and Canada, and over 400 registered users. And this is a team consisting of myself, my co-founder, Ashdel Bassi, and Doze Bakwe. And we are actually graduates of the Joseph Business School as well as the University of Iowa Venture School. That being said, why should you vote for us? Why should you invest in us? Well, I share the story with you to, let you, to, tell you, to show you that we could find creative solutions to tough problems. If you're a co-founder, if, you, if you're trying to build an app and you don't have the money to, to build it, what do most founders do? The first thing they do is try to raise capital from an investor, or they may start a Kickstarter campaign, or they may turn to family and friends, not us. During the 2016 presidential election, we saw an opportunity and capitalized on the two most popular candidates, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. And what we did was we created these cereal boxes, Lucky Trumps and Honey Nut Hilarios. And we sold each box for $50 each across the state, raising over $20,000 to do what we needed to do. So we are scrappy and we're creative, and we could get the job done. If we win today, we plan to use the money for more product development. And because I'm in the restaurant industry, that's why you see Check Please over there. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Can you talk a little bit more about how you're collecting the data around a person's eating habits and preferences? I think, unlike Waze, you're always driving and you can collect that data pretty easily, but how are you thinking about collecting the eating data and is there any like user input that happens? Sure, when, once they sign up for the app, we actually ask them pre-qualifying questions up front to kind of like personalize the search for each individual person. So if you pull up Google right now, all of you probably get the same results as to what's around you. But based on the upfront questions we're asking, we're actually personalizing that response back to you in regards to what do you have a taste for at this moment. So you said that you have 1,200 customers currently on the platform. Can you tell us, one, what are they mainly using it for? And then two, what is like the average price point that they're paying you per month? Sure, so we are currently pre-revenue right now, early stage. Um, what we've done is we've built out the app the app is the one that's allowing all the restaurants to be on the platform. So we're using that as a, as a point of contact with this restaurant so they can place their ads on the platform. The other half, the other side of this is the Beacon technology, which, is a, which allows us to put, in, put the Beacon in their restaurant, allows us to actually um, report back analytics on how the restaurant is doing, what's going on in the restaurant, you know, is it fully, fully, uh, fully, uh, is, is it fully uh, occupied or not? We're able to report some analytics back to them as well. 
Um, with the data that you're collecting, um, are you using it to drive some other information to, um, to, the, to the restaurant owners in terms of helping them manage their business better? How are you translating that for them? Sure. So conceptually, what we have put down on, and part of our, our patent pending on um, 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 thing is that we want to be able to help restaurants manage two of their two uh, cost drivers. One of them is labor, the other one is food. So, for example, a good example is that if we know that the Cubs just, you know, won the series again and, you know, and there's a lot of traffic out there, being able to let restaurants know ahead of time that you need to spike up your, tra your, your staffing right away. So being able to look at some uh, um, um, uh, information or data around the premises of these restaurants and report that back to them so these restaurants could actually um, efficiently more um, bring in staff on, or not. Um, so that's, that's one example, one of the things we're looking at. Thank you. Another round of applause, please. So now we're going to get into the presentation of Trippy by Ryan. So is Ryan anywhere? Welcome Ryan to the stage. Hello. My name is Ryan Dew, and I'm the founder of Trippy, the go-to app for navigating big airports. So usually while I'm in the airport, my typical airport experience usually goes a little something like this. I usually have a carry-on I mean, carry bag in the front, carry-on bag in the back, and I usually have a little suitcase that I drag around with me. And one time when I was in the DC airport, I actually had to trust a random stranger with my bags while I went to go explore. And when I went to go explore to find some food, I was thinking to myself, why isn't there an app out there that can help me find food in the airport? So I was just thinking, well, I'm a computer science major, like, why not just build the app myself? There goes Trippy. So the problem with airports, like myself, a lot of travelers tend to struggle to navigate airports. Airport items are incredibly overpriced, and travelers kind of juggle with that problem where they kind of see a restaurant, they're like, uh, is this kind of what I want? But is there something better by my gate? And you have to make that split second decision, like, what do I do? So that's, that's where this app comes in. Essentially, what Trippy allows you to do is allows you to search the airport by whatever you're looking for. So for example, if you're a vegan, you can search for vegan options and filter those options out. If you're, uh, if you're looking for a burger, you can search for burger and find burger spots. Um, the app also allows you the ability to track your flights, so you never have to go to that little flight board ever again. It's just right on your phone. And the app allows you to track your miles and tells you exactly kind of where you're going and actually earns, you can earn points and rewards that you can redeem on certain products um, outside and inside the airport as well. Um, the reason why we're doing this is because the most important thing to a traveler is efficiency. And we will reshape the way that travelers think by simplifying the search process and therefore introducing revenue into the airport that would not exist therefore otherwise. Uh, currently, product traction. Um, we're currently the number one airport navigation app in the App Store. Uh, have currently 50,000 users on the platform, and we're in 63 airports across the world, in all top 30 US airports, and a lot of the major airports internationally as well. Um, the team, just me. Um, I've been, <laughs> I've been uh, you know, ever since I started this, uh, I kind of just been building this product. I handle a lot of the marketing. I handle you know, all the software engineering and I've been actually working um, out of the, uh, the K4 Center in the Oakland iLab for the past six, six or seven months. Um, in college, I you know, worked for Google for a little bit, and I also played uh, NCAA Division I basketball at Colgate University as well. Um, so Impact, currently we're running an internship program with the Hidden Genius Project, and we're also doing other initiatives with Soldier Town, the basketball facility, new basketball facility in Oakland, to be able to teach young African-American males how to code and how to use uh, basketball skills, uh, how to combine coding and basketball skills to, to pursue opportunities in the technology, technology field. Um, why is this important to me? Because representation matters. Not too long ago, I was one of, those, was one of these same kids that didn't really have anybody in tech that kind of looked like me. And so me, I want to be that same person in my community to give back and give those kids someone to look up to. Um, thank you. This is Trippy.
can, can you go back to the, the slide layout that you had of the app? Yeah. What, what's, what, I'm just curious, what's, what's driving customers to utilize the app, and what is the type of customer? Is it, is it you know, just you know, regular sort of flight? person or is it the airline? Is it a little bit of both? Is it the stores in the air airport? Um, so yeah, what's driving people to use the, to use the app? Are people kind of confused on like knowing where things are? So a lot of the times I think when we're actually, uh, when you search airport maps in the app store, we're the first app you see and that's kind of the biggest driver. Our ASO is pretty high for airport maps, airport navigation. And so we're kind of getting people right when they're dealing with the problem and they're able to kind of see, and, they're, and the first thing they do when they're actually on the application is they're able to actually, uh, th we don't actually have the slide on here, um, but they're actually able to get a whole like, layout of the airport and we actually got their GPS location to be able to see exactly, and a lot of people, what they do is they open the app, they can orient themselves within the terminal, find out where they need to go, what their options are, and make a more informed decision based on that data. Can you speak a bit about your, your, your revenue projections? Like how are you capturing value to make sure that you're able to be sustainable? Absolutely, yeah, so right now we're pre-revenue. We're pre um, so right now the biggest thing that we're doing right now is being able to, we're collecting a lot of data on you know, users' tastes, users' preferences, what people are actually searching for, and we'll be able to package up a lot of this, in, this interesting data and actually share it with airports, with airlines, to be able to help them improve their customer experience and make more informed decisions um, from a business perspective. And so, you know, we're using a lot of the things that we, uh, a lot of the things that we collect to kind of help with that type of stuff. Yeah, great pitch. I love the, the opener where you, you gave a very clear message about what the app does, who it serves. Also, I would also say in your pitch, move the traction numbers that you have immediately up to the front. Okay. Like show the fact that you are in all these airports, you have all these users and you're getting all this traction and you're just one founder and you're technical too. So also highlight that. Okay. Um, I think I think the business of the app still needs some tweaks, but where you are right now, you're you're you're, you're running on all cylinders. Oh, appreciate that. Thank you. One last thing: the the ancillary businesses and data that can be created on your app because you're looking at location and you're looking at the layout of the airport. Think about how you can bring in additional revenue by selling that data to other people, meaning consultants who build airports, right? Things of that nature, yeah. right? Th think, think about those things. Uh, you know, how many people are populating in one area? Security, the whole nine. Absolutely. Yeah, and while we're on the side of feedback, I would also say that uh, I think some of the frequent flyers probably already know the airports very well that they go to, mm -hmm. but for the casual traveler, or maybe the traveler who's going to a new airport for the first time, maybe for a sporting event, maybe basketball, since there's a, uh, you have a high overlap and in interest in basketball, you can actually show like where they can go to get memorabilia or go to a, a specific restaurant that they need to go to when they're in that town. Absolutely. Like other ways where you can drive more attention and more um, value to the user who's going to this airport. Right, and I think the interesting thing about this is I feel like this model can not only be used for airports, but this same model can also be used for other indoor venues, which we call ourselves an indoor location-based advertising platform. Yeah. So in the sense of like, we can use this for not only airports, but malls, sporting arenas. And you know, I think by 2020, over 80% of airports will have invested in beacon technology, like we talked, like they talked about in the first pitch. Yeah. So essentially, it feels like you know we're starting with airports, but we feel like that this there's not really a platform in the indoor space that could, that really has done this. And so just trying to be the first to do it. Absolutely. Thank you. All right, another round of applause, please. Woo! So that was the end of our leisure category. We'll go ahead and let the judges convene, gather results. Uh, the next category is education. Thanks. I'm excited to see your presentation soon. <laughs> um, so to kick us off, I'm Elise Smith, and I am the CEO of Praxis Labs. I want to start by taking us back to 2018. It was only two months ago, so I can imagine we can all make that mental leap. <laughs> Um, in 2018, we saw, oops, I just turned off the presentation. <laughs> in 2018, we saw countless companies in the headlines for incidents of bias and discrimination. Customers and employees are no longer tolerating 
on inappropriate behaviors in their workplaces, in the environments in which they go and shop and buy products and stay in hotels. Just last year, we saw Starbucks shut down all of their stores. So 165,000 employees could go through racial bias training. We saw 20,000 Google employees walk out of their job to protest gender harassment in the workplace. Diversity and inclusion is clearly a problem for companies, and it's costing them. It's costing them in litigation, in settlements, and in brand reputation. Are these the companies we want to work for? Are these the companies we want to buy products from? Diversity and inclusion has become a competitive advantage because of this. It's a business imperative. We can no longer get it wrong. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but diverse, more diverse and inclusive companies are more likely to have above average profits, they're more likely to make better decisions, and they're more likely to retain top talent. K4 has actually released some research that has found that companies are losing tons of money in what they call unfairness turnover. These are folks who are leaving because of profiling, of bias, of harassment, and it's costing technology companies $16 billion. And that's just technology companies. This is a major issue, and we haven't figured out how to do it right. It's actually not because of a lack of spending. Companies are spending up to $8 billion a year on diversity and inclusion trainings, and it's growing year over year. Of course, this isn't a high enough number for the uh, scope of the problem, but it should be causing something to change. The problem? We're spending money on the wrong things. 63% of leaders believe that their trainings are ineffective. Of course we're not going to solve the problem if this is the case. That's where Praxis comes in. Praxis Labs is reimagining diversity and inclusion. Leveraging the power of immersive experiences and perspective taking, we're putting employees and users into the body, into the experience, seeing the world through the, in the lens of someone different than themselves. We're doing this because we know this can increase empathy, this can reduce bias, and this can create sustained behavioral change. So what does this mean? What does this look like for an employee? It means you walk into the office, you hold up a headset or your smartphone, and you're immediately transported into a new immersive workplace or environment. You look at yourself in the mirror, but it's not yourself. It's you, but you're in a different identity or a different background or a different perspective. You go through a workplace environment narrative where you're able to engage in the storyline through interactivity and branching. You're able to experience implicit bias. You might see a discriminatory practice, and then you can decide both implicitly and explicitly, how you respond. What do you do in situations like that when you're being exposed to implicit bias, when you're seeing it happen? These, this narrative will take about 10 minutes to go through this experience. You'll then take off the headset and you'll have time to reflect. What did you just see? What just happened? What did you learn? You'll be able to ask questions. We'll provide facts and context around the experience you went through, how often this occurs in workplace environments, and what this means for the company that you work in and how you can be a better active uh, interrupter and disruptor of just injustice. And in a one hour or one and a half hour training, you would go through this experience about three different times with, again, multiple reflection periods and time to learn a little bit about what you just saw. Why does this work? Why are 100 plus companies that we've talked to, diversity and inclusion leaders, so excited, knocking down our doors to try and pilot this? It's because we're leveraging best-in-class diversity and inclusion research. I know from the folks, the service providers I've worked with and from the academic research that empathy and perspective taking are key drivers to diversity and inclusion outcomes. I also know from the research that's coming out of Stanford Virtual Human Interaction Lab and other labs like it, that VR is uniquely positioned to enable perspective taking, to increase empathy. Praxis, we sit in the middle of this. We're pairing best in class diversity and inclusion research with the only medium that's enabling people to actually get that perspective taking, to build that empathy. We're also underneath all of that, uh, pairing our work with best in class and new standards for diversity and inclusion metrics. Unlike before, we'll be able to link trainings to actual diversity and inclusion outcomes to show that we're making a difference. Our customers in the space are not doing what they need to do again. The leaders themselves think they're ineffective, but to go through quickly, their e-learning modules, their click through, their check the box, they're not engaging, they're not effective. 
In-person workshops are a little bit more effective. That said, it varies by trainer and facilitator. It is extremely hard to scale and quite costly. When we spoke to Walmart's chief diversity officer, he said, how am I gonna get 1.4 million employees through high quality in-person workshops? Our target market right now is 1.6 billion, a smaller piece of that $8 billion market we mentioned earlier. That said, we know this is growing. The chief diversity officer position is new. That means a whole new ecosystem is being built. There's a whole new multi-million dollar budget to grab, and no one's captured that market yet. Our plan moving forward is to pilot with two to three companies this summer. We have over seven companies who have asked for statements of work for pilot. Uh, right now, we're going to continue building out that full one hour training so we can get the data and feedback we need to continue to land and expand with potential customers moving forward. We're doing everything we can to be scrappy and pitching to raise enough money to fund that development and contract out some additional talent. That said, we have a really strong team, and I know that we're the team to bring this to market. Not only do we have the business skills, but we have the technical skills, and we have the passion. My background, I come from IBM Watson, where I was developing early Watson for Education products. I also led business development and sales with the IBM Watson education team. More recently, I was investing in entrepreneurs who were trying to solve diversity and inclusion problems. I was helping to create diversity and inclusion strategies, trainings, and uh, research, uh, publishing research in the field. My team, even more outstanding. Demi has run a $50 million category at Jet.com. She has uh, years of experience at Boston Consulting Group. My teammate, Heather, she's worked at NASA on synthetic and computer vision. She's designed AR headsets at Microsoft on the HoloLens. And then my teammate, Melina, she actually works in the virtual human interaction lab where she's a 3D modeler and VR developer. She's helping us link best-in-class research with our product and our outcomes. But beyond that, we have the passion. As all women of color, we've been in workplaces that are not inclusive. We've had to disrupt bias and discrimination. And that should not be the case. In America, we can do better. And that's where Praxis comes in. We're excited to continue to make workplaces more diverse, more equitable, and more inclusive. Thank you. Uh, great presentation. Uh, I actually work at KPOR, so I'm glad that you mentioned the Tech Lever study. So if you haven't checked it out in the audience, you should definitely go to the website and learn more about the DNI numbers and tech and whatnot. Um, I have a couple questions around uh, the product itself. So who are you already partnering with? Like any companies, Fortune 500s, 10s that are looking to kind of pilot this? Also, um, around the onboarding of the employees, is this looking to be something that you want to be a solution for these companies at the beginning and the onset? Or is it just for um, people that are working in HR? Like who is exactly this targeting? And then lastly, um, around the workshops and classes, like he has a couple of questions, but uh, <laughs> what, what, what exactly is being implemented to kind of uh, push this along? So is it only going to be, again, for the onboarding or down the line, is it going to be putting folks in the shoes of a day in the life of a person of color, things like that? Yeah, so the first part of that question was, who are we partnering with right now? Uh, like I said, we have over seven companies, they're Fortune 500. Because of the statements of work we're trying to put in front of them, we're not necessarily allowed to name them, uh, but they are names you know very well. Um, in terms of your second question, which was around solution, who's this serving? We intend to serve every employee at every organization in the United States who wants to invest in diversity and inclusion. It's not just for onboarding, although we expect to have a product in the market just for onboarding. We also expect to have you know, yearly, uh, right now companies are doing yearly and quarterly diversity and inclusion trainings. We expect to be that provider in the market. Um, and your last question was around Oh, this, yeah, so the product itself is built to scale. It's uh, essentially a SaaS uh, VR product that we would send out to smartphones that you can put in tech, uh, super light tech headsets. Um, we would also then have a bit of a learning module online in which you could do engagement with a chatbot, ask questions, um, get into that data to understand the context more, like I mentioned. So it's super scalable. Um, we would then give a guidebook to the companies that we would work with and do potential customization, but right now we're looking at uh, kind of that scalable product. Are you working in any way with uh, Lumen Capital, Darren Dotson? Um, he's, he's, a, he's building out a fund to fund. I think he's trying to raise oh, yes. about $100 million dollars for implicit bias training. Yes, um, we are uh, chatting with uh, Darren Dotson and we are working in partnership with him. He's, he's wonderful. Thank you.
All right, so moving things right along. Right now we're gonna jump into, it should be prof. Um, we're gonna go into, actually school. School is next. So school, if you could come up and it's Elijah. Elias, Elias from school, give him a round of applause. Woo! Okay, um, good afternoon everyone. My name is Elias, I'm the co-founder and CEO of School, and our mission is to democratize college and career access. So I wanted to start by sharing a little bit about my team. My co-founder Alex and I um, started school uh, a couple of years ago, um, and we met at San Jose State uh, as uh, we were both pursuing engineering degrees. Um, and Alex and I uh, were very fortunate to end up at San Jose State uh, given our backgrounds, being the first in our families to go to college, um, as well as not really having uh, support or the resources to really fully vet, uh, you know, our options post high school. Um, and, uh, you know, unfortunately, you know, I mean, I think we're very lucky to sort of be at where we are now, but um, that's not the case for a lot of uh, students or the youth that have similar backgrounds as us. Um, and this is where, you know, we think there's a huge opportunity um, to be addressed. So each year, um, basically half the student population uh, in America are considered to be low income and, first, or, and or first generation. Um, and they face significant barriers to college and career access and success. Um, and besides the obvious, you know, inequities that, you know, you can see from that statistic, um, People who obtain you know, college degrees or certificates, they earn you know, significantly more than those that don't. Um, and we think that's a problem. Um, I think this is a deeply rooted problem that probably everyone here could you know, understand and relate to. Um, but we, we've identified two areas that we think, if addressed, can be um, you know, resolved in the short term. Um, and so we think the problem is on the student and, a, and the counselor side. So on the student side, um, obviously, uh, you know, the, uh, kids that are at schools that are under-resourced aren't getting enough uh, guidance or support uh, in addition to dealing with, you know, a handful of other challenges in their life. Um, and on the counselor side, you know, it's, it's a pretty well-known fact if you're in education, um, but the, the student-to-counselor ratio is, is really bad, right? It's uh, 500 to 1, and it's twice as bad at schools uh, that are predominantly serving uh, first-generation first low-income students. Um, and for our first partner that we're working with in the East Bay, it's actually six times worse. So our, uh, our first partner has 3,500 students and only one college and career counselor. Um, and so the two charts that you're seeing now are displaying the sentiment from the students that uh, we surveyed last week. Um, so 70% of them have mentioned that they have not met with their counselor at all. And many of them mentioned that they didn't even know that they were a resource and they didn't know how to take advantage of the resource. Um, meanwhile, 90% of the students have sort of self-prescribed themselves as needing the help, irregardless of where they are in their current uh, you know, journey. Uh, so that is where school comes in. So school is a web and mobile platform that helps uh, to empower students to navigate you know, this journey of figuring out what they're gonna do after uh, high school. Um, and uh, we're also helping counselors to better and more effectively manage the students that they're managing. Uh, so on the student side, we're helping students in three key ways. So we're providing them the guidance uh, through a customizable roadmap. Uh, this is basically allowing students uh, and counselors to make sure that they're you know, staying on track from the moment they start high school um, and as well as making sure that they're proactive uh, you know, we're providing them support by creating and cultivating a, a collaborative community of people who have similar backgrounds as themselves. Uh, and then we're providing them the resources to make it easier for them to actually do this research. Um, and then that's just a screenshot. Uh, and then on the counselor side, uh, we're helping the counselors in three main ways as well. So we're streamlining, streamlining the counselor's uh, workflow so they are, effectively can uh, increase their capacity to serve their students. Um, they're able to stratify their caseloads. Um, this is really a, a major pain point for counselors today, uh, as they don't generally know 
where their students are because they have so many. So this allows them to quickly diagnose and hopefully be proactive about reaching out and getting, uh, you know, designing some sort of course, corrective course of action. And then I, uh, the last thing is uh, the insights that we provide to the counselors um, uh, to help further support the students. And that's another screenshot. So market. Um, so the K-12 market, or the total addressable market is about $14.5 billion. And this is based on money that's spent on uh, technology in K-12, uh, as well as a smaller piece of $400 million that are spent on the hiring of private uh, college counselors. Um, and we believe our adjustable market uh, is about 200 million, or a little bit more than 200 million as we sell to high schools, um, community-based organizations, and a very small portion to uh, private uh, college consultants. Our competition, so we have three uh, competitors in this space, Naviance, Overgrad, and uh, School Links. Naviance by far is the incumbent in this space. They've been in the industry for a little over 10 years, um, but they're starting to face a lot of churn, mostly because their, their product is uh, not great, uh, and this is sentiment for, that I've heard from many educators, um, and that's been sort of the, uh, the inception for Overgrad and School Links, and they basically have a more modernized uh, solution, um, which does well, I think, for, for, that, for that market. However, um, for us, we're focused you know, on the first generation and low income uh, demographic. And so you know, we, we provide three key features today um, that uh, our competitors are not doing. So that includes develop, uh, providing a collaborative community, um, develop, providing to the counselors a customizable roadmap, uh, as well as uh, insights for the counselors to intervene early. Our business model is software as a service, so we charge students four dollars. I'm sorry, we charge uh, our customers four dollars a student a year, one hundred and sixty dollars uh, a counselor a year, and then we charge anywhere from one thousand to five thousand uh, dollars for onboarding, um, depending on the volume. Um, our traction and validation. Uh, so we have five partners today. Uh, three of them are community-based organizations. Two are um, schools. The three community-based organizations are already paid. The two schools are, uh, have signed LOIs indicating their interest in becoming paying customers next year, assuming we prove our efficacy. Um, and uh, so far, you know, the metrics that we have, you know, 83% of our users uh, have indicated that school has helped them in at least one aspect. Um, and then this is just some testimonials that we've gotten from our users. And thank you. So can you actually go back can you go back to the slide where you had screenshots of the actual app? Oh, yeah. And can you walk us through the app? Sure. Oh, uh, I don't know if it looks that great on but um, Yeah, so the, so the far left screen is uh, basically what, so this is just focused on the college workflow, but the first screen on the left is um, information about college making it very digestible for the student to understand what their options are uh, and uh, a way for them to uh, understand what the school provides. The second one is uh, uh, easy to use filter. So in general, the product is sort of built as a search engine slash social media product. Um, and the third picture is their profile. And this is from the person that signed in's view. Uh, they're basically looking at the options that they've indicated they're interested in by liking, the, liking that school or, or whatever, and it tells them how well it aligns with what they've indicated they're interested in. And all this information is sent back to their counselor who's managing them. Uh, and then, do you want to see the counselor side as well? Uh, and then, th these are our initial dashboards that we're providing to the counselor to allow them to do the early intervention uh, and better manage their, their uh, caseload. So I, I was a public school student um, going to Prince George's County, Maryland. And uh, the, th this is such a huge issue. I'm incredibly excited to see the kind of platform and framework. I'm curious about your approach to partnerships, right? I'm thinking about like Scali, right? The app that's connecting folks to scholarship applications. It seems that there would be such an incredible kind of synergy. How are you conceptualizing the way you're gonna engage with other partners? Yeah, so um, there are definitely other people in products in the ecosystem that we intend to partner with. So Scali and Chris is definitely one that we're talking to. Um, because a lot of the students that we talk to, you know, one of their 
biggest concerns is how they're going to pay for school, right? And obviously, Scholarly already has that. So I think for us, that's sort of a natural uh, partnership. Um, but uh, in terms of, when you say partners, are you saying like strategic partners, or are you saying like school partners? So strategic partners, yeah. So um, I think we're also par partnering with nonprofits. Um, so right now, uh, we're, we have some interns that are helping us from America Needs You, and they have a whole lot of Okay, yeah, I was just gonna ask. So, um, as you know, and as you mentioned, Naviance is a dominant and entrenched player in this space. They have a lot of money, a huge sales force. We've been thinking about how are you gonna go to market and kind of disrupt that dominant player? Yeah, so it's a great question. Um, so, so, we've started locally um, in, in the East Bay, and some of them that are currently using Naviance, they're, for, they're already sort of on the cusp of dropping them, but they haven't yet because there, there isn't a better solution. That's kind of one thing. The second thing is they're just used to the status quo, right? And our thing is, I mean, if you don't like the product, it's not really, and the, and the, and the other biggest issue is that there's very little student engagement, right? I think it's, it's helpful for the, the administrators and the educators, um, but the student side isn't really being addressed. And I think that's where we sort of come in and provide a product that hopefully will be engaging to the student. Um, but hopefully I answer your question. All right, so moving things right along. Give him another round of applause. Thanks, Elias. So now we're going to jump into um, Prof. Prof. Three sixty. Yeah, Prof. Three sixty. So yeah, yeah, yeah. We have we have Lisa coming to the stage. Prof. Three sixty. Take the. Good afternoon, my name is Lisa Hammond and I am the CEO and co-founder of Prop360. We provide a cloud-based platform for higher education for managing faculty with part-time faculty in mind as we're doing it. So there's a crisis in higher education and that crisis includes everything from people questioning the relevance of higher education to the cost of education Schools are closing throughout the country. Um, ed higher education is bureaucratic. And students are asking about diversity in their faculty. The common way schools are trying to solve this problem is that they're having more online programs. They're also hiring a lot of part-time faculty. In fact, today, part-time faculty are 50% of faculty in the United States and that trend is growing nation is growing worldwide. Higher ed so this isn't working to save money for the for higher education. They're stuck in an old paradigm, they use old methods, they are um, part-time faculty turnover is ten times that of any other employee in a university. And so what they do is they end up hiring more administrators to manage that process. They also use old methods that are very manual and the schools are very decentralized. For example, to get a little bit of information, say someone's CV, a syllabus, they may end up making a call to one person, a call to another person, uh, email, and then doing a lot of follow-up. As they do that, it's taking time and the dean may have asked for the information. He gets it and thinks, okay, well, I've got the information, not a problem. But we looked at, there needs to be a solution. So I spent, I've spent over 20 years in higher education. I've been the chief human resources officer at three universities. And I said, there's got to be a better way talking to my colleagues and my own experience. Therefore, we built Prop 360. We started with Prof Hire, which was the first which was the first part of the platform, and Prof Hire was designed to give vetted faculty to universities. Then we very quickly realized that our entire platform was something that they needed to manage all of their faculty and to create efficiencies. The platform is device agnostic. They can use it on any device on both sides, both the university side, the administrators, and the faculty are able to use it. 
For the administrators, they're able to get all of the faculty information in one place very easily, and, and they don't have to search around for it. On the, on the faculty side, they're able to get information from the university and also provide you information to the university on the same platform. Market opportunity is $2.9 billion is spent by universities in the United, colleges, universities, post-secondary institutions in the United States for simply hiring and onboarding faculty. That does not include the faculty member's salary. As we expand, we see ourselves expanding beyond higher education to K-12, to training organizations, and then into other sectors as well as internationally. At that point, it becomes greater than a $100 billion market. Our traction, so we started charging in 2017. We had 2,500 people on the platform at that time in five universities. Today, we, so then we kind of um, did, I wouldn't say a pivot, but we paused a few, a while as we developed the SaaS platform for everyone. And this year, we've actually exceeded our numbers even in February that we had before. There are some competitors in some areas of the platform and where we really stand out is we provide vetted faculty or vetted candidates. We also have a very user-friendly platform across all devices. So I mentioned my expertise, I'm Lisa Hammond. I have two co-founders, Jonathan Jang is a startup entrepreneur, has worked in five startups, he's a software engineer, and he's worked for companies that have sold to Oracle. Toth Oda is a data architect and has higher education experience. He's also a part-time faculty member. Our advisory team includes two college presidents, two marketing experts, no, three marketing experts, two ed tech entrepreneurs, and two funding experts. And with that, I will turn it over for questions. Oh, great oh, really job in the presentation. I really, Thanks. really liked it. Um, what, what caused the major growth in, in users or customers between 2018 and 2019? And then more specifically, how often are the users using the platform on a, on a like, what is your monthly active user count for, uh, for your platform? That's a great question, and I don't know the answer to the active user account, <laughs> but what, did ca what caused it is we really went to market. So in 2017, 18, we were doing a lot of development of the SaaS side of it, of the faculty management, data management side. So we weren't really out talking to um, schools in the same way. Can you speak to the monetization aspect of it and how much you've generated over the years? I didn't quite catch that. To the what? How much have you generated up till now in terms of revenue and how are you um, receiving, um, how has the funds been generated for you? Yeah, so um, in 2017, we did very little. We had about 15,000 in, in revenue. In 2018, we pretty much doubled that and at this time, we're at 70,000 at the moment. Can you walk me through your, your product roadmap? Uh, I'm, and also the second point is I'm curious about uh, just substitute teacher market you mentioned going into you know, uh, K-12. K K-12. Yeah. So we, we really see the SaaS platform, the faculty management side, being the thing that'll expand beyond higher education. We're really looking at uh, the, faculty, the vetted faculty being for higher education only. Um, so the, the platform has the hiring and recruiting, the recruiting, hiring, and onboarding. And then it has document retention, document creation, and it's great for, or for schools when they're going for accreditation, it's good for um, evaluation and promotion, and all of the things that happen with faculty that are very labor intensive if they don't have this type of a platform. And there's also e-contracting that's done regardless of where they are on any platform. Bit of feedback. Um, I would suggest um, to look at the validation piece for a high school, for K through 12 mm -hmm. as well, uh, given that you think about special needs 
um, kids and things of this nature, being able to validate those people that come onto the platform early is actually an added advantage okay. for a lot of schools. The other piece is uh, daycare centers. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's another component that you may want to look at okay. um, as well. That'd be great. Right, that's good. Okay, so quickly, they're going to figure out who won the education sector. I'm giving you guys 30 seconds to do it while I'll tell a couple of jokes. Um, everyone else, quickly vote at this link. You have 30 seconds to vote. We need to move forward um, to be respectful of everyone's time, those who are leaving and those who are coming. Every entrepreneur who presented today, you guys are impressive and you guys are great. So before I announce the winners, I just want you to know that no one actually lost today. These people up here have access to over, let me see, sorry, Shantae. Over a hundred million dollars, all right? And they now know your names, they know your products. They were impressed by every single one of you. So it's your job now, even if you didn't win, to go access that 100 million dollars, to go access that network to go access the advice that they can give you, all right? We also have our consolation prizes. I'm not gonna announce those. I'm only gonna announce the main winners. Talk to me afterwards and I'll let you know if you won the consolation prize. And again, it's worth Google credits all the way up to $100,000 in credits. And that's huge. That could be used for AdWords, that could be used for the APIs. So it can take your business to the next level. Cool, everybody good? So the winner of the travel section <laughs> Sorry, it's Trippy. Congratulations, Trippy. Stay up here for a photo op. All right, quickly, quickly, we're moving. The next winner of the services is Min Wo. Stay up here, Min Wo. Catch your opportunity. The next winner is Ball by Yourself for the retail. And our last winner is Praxis. Where is Praxis? Practice, hurry up, bring me a check. All right, let's take a quick photo and then we're done. Thank you everyone. Remember, all contestants come talk to me about the consolation prizes.